Welcome, welcome everyone to Science and Consciousness Exploring Beyond the Brain. We are so incredibly delighted to have you here with us today. I'm seeing many people coming in, so welcome. Please put your name and location in the chat. We always love to see who our global community is with us on this call. So we would love to read out some of your names and location. We've got Johnny from Sweden, welcome. Bob from Brazil. We've got Arizona, Oakland, beautiful. Love seeing the names coming in. Maryland, Canada, London, Ireland. So welcome India, love seeing all of the names and places coming into the chat right now and more and more people are streaming in. So just a huge, huge welcome to this really special event. We're so grateful that you are here with us today. And um, I'm gonna get started with some logistics, but I just invite you to continue to share um, your name, your location, and get to know who else is on this call um, with us. So we already have over 600 people here and counting. So welcome again. So great to see you all. And whether this is your first IONS event or you've been with us for decades, we are so glad to have you here with us today during this special event where we will be giving the Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Award and having some really deep conversations around science and consciousness as we are exploring beyond the brain. So my name is Andrea Livingston. I'm the Associate Director of Engagement and Partnerships here at IONS, and I will be your host for the next three hours. And we have just an extraordinary event planned for our time together. So you'll see here on the screen our schedule, and I'll just give some brief highlights. We'll be starting out with a presentation from Claudia Wells, our IONS Interim CEO and Board Chair shortly. We'll be able to have a presentation from Dr. Dean Radin and move right into a panel. So we have two panel discussions today. Um, we're really excited to announce those um, award winners as well. And um, we'll have an experiential by Louisa Teach. So that's just some brief highlights as you'll see there on the screen. We're chatting in the link. Um, to our website that has the full schedule if you'd like to hear about the times of our event. So go ahead and check that out if you'd like to get more information. And just a few more logistics before we dive into this exciting special event. We have back in Zoom support from our program coordinator, Elena Brown, who will help you out with any technical difficulties. So at any point, you can send the chat to host and panelists and she'll get right back to you. And we are recording this event and the video will be posted on our website later today. And we are sharing a link in the chat so you can watch today's event later or share it with others. And we do have auto-generated closed captioning available today. So simply click the CC button on your Zoom menu to enable that. And we do not have an official Q&A today, but please feel free to use the chat function if you have thoughts related to today's topic and you'd like to share with the group. Um, however, you'll see on your screen, if you do find the chat distracting, just click on the arrow next to the chat icon, then unclick show chat previews to hide it. And all of our IONS free programs, as well as our scientific research, are entirely funded by the generous gifts from our members and donors. So just huge wave of gratitude for all of you who support the mission of IONS. And if you're not a member and would like to be a part of the IONS community, please consider becoming a member for an annual gift of $60 or becoming a sustainer member for $10 a month. So we would love to have you join us. So I think that's it for the announcements. Um, really excited for today's event, for the award and all of the discussions that will be happening. So thank you again for joining us. And I am so delighted to pass it on to our IONS Interim CEO and Board Chair, Claudia Wells. And her work with IONS began in the 90s when IONS President Willis Harmon invited her to join a five-year inquiry on peace building 
while she was at the University of California at Berkeley. Claudia knew IONS founder and astronaut Edgar Mitchell for many years, and it's just such a pleasure to have you kick off our special event, Claudia. So thank you for being with us today, and I will pass it to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It is such a privilege to be with all of you for what is really a historic event for IONS. And I have the privilege and the somewhat daunting task of sharing the ION story in 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna jump right in and welcome you officially to the science of consciousness exploring beyond the brain, during which we are going to be announcing the winners of the very first Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Research Prize established by IONS with the visionary generosity of board member Linda O'Brien to help advance science beyond the Western materialist paradigm. This is work that IONS has been doing since 1973. And today's prize is a profound example of how IONS is still living our legacy today. A legacy of creating a global mind change based on the science of interconnectedness. That legacy started with an epiphany in space more than 50 years ago, when our founder, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, became the sixth man to walk on the moon in 1971. Dr. Mitchell had advanced degrees in aeronautics and astronautics, and he believed in the dominant materialist scientific paradigm so much that he trusted his life to it by strapping himself to a rocket and letting it take him to the moon. And his trust was repaid. He was returned home safely, but he was also provided with a life-changing epiphany on the way. This epiphany became known as the overview effect, in which instead of the dead universe full of separate objects he was trained to expect, Ed saw things in their separateness, but he experienced them in their unity. And he perceived a loving and intelligent universe permeated by consciousness that he himself was actually an integral part of. He felt this epiphany foreshadowed a new wave of human evolution, revealing vast potentials in consciousness and just in time to put humanity on a desperately needed new trajectory. And this is more true today. In a sign of how skeptical established thought remained of Ed's experience of the fundamental nature of consciousness and the unity of all things, a New York Times tribute to him 45 years after he returned from the moon included the cheeky title, an astronaut goes to the moon and makes it most of the way back. But Ed was not discouraged by skeptics. He was convinced not only that there was a scientific basis to his epiphany that could be discovered, but that it was a latent capacity in everyone, a capacity that to a large degree has allowed humankind to evolve. He wanted secular scientific answers to why and how it happened so he could share those answers with the world in ways that would be seen as credible because he was concerned about our prospects for survival. And he knew that what we believe about ourselves and about our limitations equals the way we treat ourselves, each other, and the planet. Ed further believed that epiphany was only one of many extended human capacities that while not currently explainable by physical laws are nonetheless natural, not supernatural and well within the domain of science to understand. And he believed that once we did understand, understand it, the impact on science would be revolutionary. Meanwhile, he also knew that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So he created ions to collect extraordinary evidence that would reveal the materialist paradigm is incomplete. Ions became one of the first to study, to fund studies like remote viewing, like this one in 1974, co-funded by NASA, with now legendary Russell Targ and Harold Putoff of the Stanford Research Institute, to study the ability of certain people to accurately describe chosen locations shielded from normal means of perception. This investigation continues today as we continue to contribute research on remote viewing and other abilities pointing to the existence of a non-local consciousness, one we're embedded in rather than one locked in our heads. 
maybe even something that we are instead of something that we have. The same year, a seminal book edited by SRI social scientist Willis Harmon with contributions from Carl Jung and others called Changing Images of Man was published by SRI. Leading to another book by Willis in the 1980s called Global Mind Change. By this time, Willis Harmon was president of IONS because he recognized that we were living through a period of fundamental change in Western thought and held that no economic, political, or military power could compare with the power of a change of mind. Creating a global mind change by introducing new scientific thought to different sectors of human activity, like business, politics, ecology, and education, became an important part of our work and an important part of my work with IONS. Through programs like this one in the 80s, Science Policy Implications of Exceptional Abilities Research, an IONS collaboration with the Smithsonian and co-funded by the NSF, IONS was solidifying its reputation as a place where scientists and scholars had the freedom to investigate what they couldn't investigate elsewhere, and an increasingly credible platform to share and to further their findings and intuitions. In the 90s, IONS hired researcher Marilyn Schlitz and Dean Radin and began emphasizing our own science programs. An example here was the launch of the Global Consciousness Project with Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab to try to answer the question, can movements of collective mind be observed in matter? Something we'd expect to see in a paradigm where consciousness is fundamental. This work continues today in a 2.0 collaboration with HeartMath and with an additional level of inquiry. If indeed movements of collective mind can be observed as interacting with our physical world, will humanity use that knowledge to create a better world for all? By the 2000s, interest in popular culture of the implications of our research was increasing. We appeared in Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol novel, in science programming like Through the Wormhole, and in theater documentaries. This last decade has seen IONS optimizing our capacity to help meet the intensifying needs of a world in crisis. Today, there are 362 peer-reviewed publications by our current science team alone and 27 ongoing research projects within our IONS Discovery Lab and IONS X initiatives, a partial list of which you see here on the right. And all of these are conducted with scientific humility rigorous scientific protocol, and an eye to relevance and impact for a world in profound transition, as is our legacy. Ours is not purely academic work. We know that the way humanity chooses to move forward has real consequences for all life, and we hope to help equip humanity to be become the change we must see in the world. In this new era for IONS, we'll need to continue to walk the fine line between being seen as too out there and being seen as the really credible scientific organization that we are, and to continue pulling philosophy, physics, neuroscience, mysticism, and other relevant disciplines together the way many may not do. It's been our tradition to be 30 to 50 years ahead of our time. The science of meditation, of the mind-body connection, of personal transformation. IONS was there at the very beginning with just a handful of others providing scientific evidence to help validate these human capacities. Even the overview effect has captured the imagination of the mainstream after William Shatner went into space with Blue Origin. Will we see the same kind of progress with the science of mind beyond the brain as with the benefits of meditation and the mind-body connection? Only time will tell, but it feels essential that we do for our collective well-being and the well-being of our planet and our universe as we edge ever closer to becoming a multi-planetary species. Now I'd like to invite our chief scientist, Dean Radin, to join us. And I'd like to introduce Dean by quoting Dr. Larry Dossie, who called Dean the Einstein of parapsychology. And UC Berkeley's Dr. David Presti, who later called Dean a modern day Galileo of psychical research. Which one is he? Could he be both? Again, perhaps only time will tell. 
Thank you for your attention and please welcome Dean Radin. Well, that's a hard act to follow. I can't be Einstein because I don't have the hair and I also don't have a much of a beard, so I'm not sure I can be Galileo either, but I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about consciousness as the two Qs and the two Cs. The two Qs are qualia and quanta, and the two Cs are what we call little c and big C. Qualia has two problems associated with it. The easy problem, what are the neural correlates of consciousness? That's what the neurosciences are studying today. And the hard problem, how does awareness emerge from matter? Which of course is, both of these were uh, specified by philosopher David Chalmers. I think the, better, the best way of thinking about how hard the hard problem is was said by Jerry Fodor in 1992. He said, nobody has the slightest idea how anything material can be conscious. Nobody even knows what it would be like to have the slightest idea about how anything material could be conscious. So that was 1992. Here we are uh, quite a few years later, and still nobody knows how a uh, three pounds of neural tissue in your head can be self-aware. And so maybe sometimes when you're you have faced with a problem that is seems to be unresolvable, maybe the premise is wrong. And so the other cue is quanta, which has to do with the quantum observer effect. As you probably know, if you have a double slit optical system and you do not look where the photons are going through the two slits, you end up with this interference pattern here. And if you do know, with what the photons are doing, you end up with a particulate pattern. So this is this observer effect, otherwise known as the wave particle nature of light, is a mystery. And again, David Chalmers and Kelvin McQueen wrote this very interesting chapter for a book on consciousness and the collapse of the wave function. Well, the upshot of it is that consciousness collapse interpretations of quantum mechanics are are not clearly correct, but there is a research program here worth exploring. So a couple of years ago, there was a survey among physicists studying the foundational issues of quantum mechanics. And so they asked them a series of questions, one of which is, in your opinion, the observer is, which one of these four do you think? So a complex quantum system should play no fundamental role whatsoever, plays a fundamental role in the application of the formalism, but no distinguished physical role, and plays a distinguished physical role. This last one is that there's something peculiar about, uh, um, about conscious observation in changing the way that the physical world works. Well, we've been studying this using a double slit optical system for quite a while. Uh, the, the citations here in black are the ones we've done at ions and the ones in purple have been done in other laboratories. So, so far, five laboratories have done these experiments, a total of about 30 experiments, of which 14 so far are actually statistically significant. We need to be very cautious about all this because these experiments are relatively new. And you normally want to do a more sophisticated way of saying whether or not the experiments are repeating. But so far, at least at a, at a high level, it looks like there really is something interesting going on. And so a few months ago, an article was published by uh, the scientists in, at a un university in Ireland in the journal called Progress in Brain Research, and they reviewed this, this category, this class of experiments. And the important point of their abstract is this, contrary to the common belief that physical offense have a unidirectional first order causal effect on cognition, these studies suggest that mental activities are capable of influencing physical systems. And so this is quite interesting because this is, I did not know these, these authors. I didn't even know that anybody was paying attention to this, uh, this line of research, but apparently people are. And coming to the same conclusion that, that myself and some of my colleagues have come to saying that there is something very interesting about the mind matter interaction. So the two C's, the, the little C is personal consciousness. It's me, it's ego, it's self. Big C we can call the universal consciousness, the, what we would think of as a mystical or spiritual 
or I am time of consciousness. And what many do not realize is that the origins of quantum mechanics actually began with most of the founders of quantum mechanics being idealists and specifically interested in mysticism. In fact, as it says in this article, which is published in a physics journal, a mystical hypothesis, one assigning the mind a role to play at the material level of reality, shaped the way physicists understood quantum mechanics, even at the level of fundamental equations. In 1994, Willis Harman, who was the president at the time, and a bunch of other uh, collaborators, wrote this book called New Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science. And in it, they're asking this, does the nature and belief of the observer have anything to do with what is observed? This book is the fruit of the IONS Causality Project, which was research into what constitutes reality and how things happen, to the assumptions embedded in the current, and this was 1994, scientific paradigm place blinders on what contemporary science is free to discover. And of course, yes, they do. They always do. Uh, but we've been pursuing this issue since then. Uh, that's why our experiments looking at the role of the observer in the formation of physical reality seem to be showing interesting effects and are, are now slowly being replicated by others. One of the ways that we, we discuss our research is by publishing in journals like Frontiers in Psychology, which is one of the most cited academic psychology journals out there, in this paper that we wrote, What if Consciousness is Not an Emerging Property of the Brain? Observational Empirical Challenges to Materialistic Models. And in particular, you look here at the score that this, uh, there's, this is called Altmetric score, which looks at millions of published articles to see the impact. So this only came out uh, less than a year ago, and it's already in the top 5% of all of the research tracked by Altmetric, and then the 98th percentile in terms of high attention, and the 99th percentile in terms of comparing outputs of the same age and source. So more and more people are becoming interested in these kinds of questions. So what is our mission? I like to think of it as exploring the outer limits of inner space. And our prevailing assumption is that matter, and this is a working hypothesis, matter is fundamental. That means uh, the prevailing assumption in science today is that consciousness equals brain activity. Or said in other words, by Marvin Minsky, we are machines made of meat. Or by Francis Crick, we're nothing but a, a pack of neurons. This is the philosophy of nihilism, a pointless existence, and said sometimes by the quip, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's science today, nothing matters. On the other hand, we have noetic experiences, like connections that transcend space and time. Uh, they're called by science today as illusory or false or impossible. They're very difficult to accommodate within today's science. Nevertheless, there's a hard problem out there which suggests that consciousness may not be equal to brain activity. It might be associated with it in some way, but not identical. So we ask the question, well, what if consciousness really is fundamental, that it transcends space and time, and noetic experiences, everything from psychic to spiritual to mystical, are in fact real? That's what we study. And as Leonardo da Vinci said then, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. So how do we do that? Well, we study noetic experiences using the tools and techniques of cognitive and perceptual psychology, psychophysiology, the neurosciences, cell biology, genomics, optical and quantum physics, qualitative methods, questionnaires, and so on. So we did this, started this in 1973. We were very far from the mainstream then because we were studying these kinds of things way back then. Well, what about now? So these are all within the last couple of years. And these are all mainstream websites that are reporting what, the, what science is now looking at. So does consciousness explain quantum mechanics? A wild theory suggests that consciousness may explain quantum mechanics. So science is, is now able to discuss this openly. It's still called a wild theory because it's, it's not absolutely mainstream, but the very fact that it's being discussed is already really interesting. Here's another case, uh, why some scientists believe the universe is conscious. They're not mystics, 
But materialism is not giving good answers, so they're looking around. Another example, some scientists believe the universe is conscious. Sounds like a bad trip, but what if it's true? And again, these are all contemporary. These are all coming out now. Does consciousness pervade the universe, Scientific American? Uh, this one is a, a website about space research and astronomy. Can our brains help prove the universe is conscious? If we can find the answer, it may complete our understanding of the universe. I think that's probably not actually complete, but it'll at least add to our understanding of the universe. Another one from uh, NBC, Science News, is the universe conscious, conscious? Some of the world's most renowned scientists are questioning whether the cosmos has an inner life similar to ours. New scientists, is the universe conscious? It seems impossible until you do the maths. What they're uncovering suggests that to achieve a precise description of consciousness, we may have to accept that all kinds of inanimate matter could be conscious, maybe even the universe as a whole. Oh no. So is consciousness everywhere? Uh, conscious awareness is now being seen in what we think is unexpected places, including animals, large and small, perhaps even in brute matter itself, and also in things like bees. This is the MIT press reader. And then Big Think, four of the hardest unsolved problems in philosophy, and by the way, in science, and some possible solutions, including consciousness. Uh, this funny quote is in the, the article, not all philosophers to accept that chairs can have experiences, but that is one of the implications. Another example from NPR is the universe conscious. And in physics journals, a new place for consciousness and our understanding of the universe. To make sense of mysteries like quantum mechanics and the passage of time, theorists are trying to reformulate physics to include subjective experience as a physical constituent of the world. So how do we do this? Well, in the, the experiments that we're doing, at least the ones that I've been involved in directly, the Be All Foundation, Federico and Elvia uh, Fajin Foundation, the Fetzer Foundation, Emerald Gate Foundation, John Brockway Huntington Foundation, Hitman Family Foundation, and individuals like Jeff Parrott, Dick and Connie Adams, and a new organization called RENCEP have all contributed uh, toward the studies that we're, lo we're looking at here, which are relevant to what I was just talking about. Does conscious observation affect the physical world? Whoops, and it looks like I've run out of time. Tick tock. So I'm going to stop at this point. Great. Thank you, Dean, for that great overview. And in a moment, we're going to get deeper into this topic of non-local models of consciousness. And Dean is going to moderate a discussion with our panelists. And so let me just briefly introduce our panelists, our first panel. Um, so we have got Teresa Chung, who has been researching and writing about spirituality, dreams, and the paranormal for the past 25 years. Her spiritual books have been translated into over 40 languages, and she's really just been a huge advocate for the science of spirituality. So we're great to have you, Teresa. And Jude, Dr. Jude Hervan is a cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist, and author. In 2017, she co-founded Whole World View, seeking to empower the understanding experiencing and embodying of unitive awareness to serve collective and planetary healing and conscious evolution. And unfortunately, Dr. Jonathan Schooler at the last minute was not able to join us today. So we wish him well, but we'll get a little bit extra time with Teresa and Jude. And so um, thank you each for being here. And Dean, I will pass it back to you. Thank you. So we originally were gonna give you about four minutes each for these, but now you probably have five or even longer minutes. So the first question then is, and I'll, I'll direct this to Teresa, uh, what do you think is the most promising theory or model of non-local consciousness today? As a simple, by, by the way, a very simple question. It's, it's like asking, what do you think God is? It's kind <laughs> of along that line. So you have the floor now. 
Well, if God is anywhere, I think it's definitely at Ions. <laughs> but gratitude, thank you for having me here today. Um, what light through yonder window breaks. Happy midsummer, everyone attending here. And Ions couldn't have picked a more synchronistic date than today to celebrate or start celebrating their 50 glowing years of illumination that has truly lit up the world. And I am joining you from the land of Shakespeare, and I'm acutely aware that I'm not a scientist. I'm not a professor, but I am a noetic experiencer who relentlessly champions for the non-specialist, the belief that we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And it truly is a Midsummer Night's Dream for me to be here today. I'm doing my reality checks. I have dedicated my life to spreading the word that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, mainstreaming for the general reader rather than the specialist what IONS painstakingly researches. But as mentioned, I'm not a scientist. So I want to thank you, IONS, from the bottom of my heart and the depths of my soul for generously inviting me here to participate alongside these incredible panelists. Thank you. Okay, without further ado, I will attempt to answer your question. I read your recent breakdown of all the theories of non-local consciousness published in Frontiers in Psychology. Yep, I read it, D, and then I read it again, and again, <laughs> and again, and I'm going to return to it like a time loop. Now, the repeat reading was not just because the material is so expansive, but also to mine own self be true here, for a non-scientist, and to risk yet another Shakespeare reference, it was Greek to me, not that easy to grasp. So I really am here as a representative of the practitioner, the experiencer, the non-specialist. My answer is therefore going to be a kind of a curveball. In my humble opinion, every single theory for non-local consciousness is encouraging. The very fact that scientists are even considering that consciousness can act, exist outside body and brain, independent of mind, and that these theories are being taken seriously and better still tested for their practical value at IOMS is the promise. It validates all the anecdotal stories and insights I have shared for over three decades in an endless series of books, interviews, talks, and media. And it gives my work much needed backbone to reference and answer to those skeptics who dismiss what I talk about so often as woo woo. And that is why I never fail to champion IONS because you truly are leading the world in promoting this research. But more importantly, you are playing the lead global role in shifting that research from academic journals, really written from, for your peers, to practical application in real life, making it accessible to the non-specialist like me and helping people like me understand how it can be of value and benefit. And in the process, one small IONS research step at a time, you are guiding vast numbers of people all over the world to take a giant leap forward and lose their fear of what they cannot yet understand and get curious and awestruck about it instead. You are constantly demonstrating that there are indeed more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Sorry, I can't help it, I'm a Shakespeare buff. So, just like today's midsummer light breaking through yonder window, my future self is entirely convinced that more than any one specific theory of non-local consciousness, it will be the humble, open-minded, collaborative spirit of ions and the groundbreaking research you, you do yourselves and you promote like you are today, which will be the way forward. The illuminating ray of hope, meaning interconnection and inspiration that's gonna bring some much needed healing to our world. Wow. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and the Shakespeare is appreciated as well. Of course. <laughs> okay, Jude, now, now it's your turn. <laughs> well, it's I love the synchronicity, Teresa. I was just about to quote that same quote. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio. 
but I'd say it slightly differently to paraphrase Shakespeare than have been dreamt of in your philosophy, because I feel we're dreaming a new dream now. And it's an ancient dream that we're remembering and we're remembering it thanks to the, the scientific method, which of course Francis Bacon, who some say was Shakespeare, began 400 years ago to this year. And Francis actually um, came forward with an empirical methodology because he realized that the superstition of his times was unable to delve into the deeper understanding of the nature of reality. So what we've been on is a 400 year journey, but it seems to me and Teresa, I suspect you'll appreciate this too, that Francis was not to peripheralize the divine, but hoping that his empirical method by following the evidence wherever it led would actually reveal the divine. And that is where I feel we're on the threshold today. So as a cosmologist and also as a noetic experiencer since I was four years old, I'm delighted that we seem to be, well, not seem, we are in a time of convergence of leading edge science at all scales of existence and many fields of research with universal wisdom teachings. And again, as a, as a researcher in this realm and as a curious, as someone who's been curious about the nature of reality since I was a very small child, what is emerging, it seems to me, with all that evidence is our universe, we're finding that the appearance of our universe is not its fundamental nature. That the, the science of the 20th century of energy matter and quantized energy matter and of space time, of relativistic space and time and their combination as invariant space time, that is the appearance of our universe. But we're now finding evidence, compelling evidence, that that appearance emerges, arises from deeper levels of non-physical realms of causation and manifesting as meaningful in formation. And cosmologists progressively now are coming to a, a consensus that our universe manifests in that way, holographically, not that it's less real, but that its whole is literally embodied in each and every one of its pixelated parts. And profoundly, and, and Claudia just touched on this, that we're finding, uh, as Phil Goff has written about, is that mind and consciousness aren't something we have, but literally what we and the whole world are. So all of those articles that Dean, you referred to, and there was a March 2023 um, article in the Scientific American saying, is the universe a hologram? And Professor Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw's latest book last October on black holes came to the same perspective. We don't know how this happens, but it seems our universe is a hologram. So this is opening the door ever wider to my congratulations with Teresa on all the incredible work that IONS are doing to help us understand, as Dean, you said, how our microcosmic consciousness is essentially a co-creator of universal consciousness. And just to say perhaps a couple of more things in terms of the evidence for all of this, um, for decades, in fact, going back to the very earliest days of, of the quantum physicists, the pioneers who had this perspective, many of them, there was an understanding that for quantum mechanics to operate at all, to work at all, that our entire universe had to be non-locally unified. And of course, at that point, it was a theoretical prediction. It was a thought experiment. And it was only in the 1980s and onwards that researchers were able to sort of test this out at larger and larger scales, culminating in 2018 with a, a five university research of entangling photons of light in a laboratory with starlight from 600 light years away and light from a quasar which is a very active galactic center, 12.2 billion light years away to trigger the whole entanglement. And what they found was indeed that, uh, that quantum non-locality extends to those cosmological scales. And since then, late last year, the Nobel Prize for Physics was given to three researchers. Anton Zellinger, who was part of that 
um, entanglement uh, uh, exercise in, in 2018, Alan Aspect and John Clauser. Researchers who've been studying non, uh, non-locality at universal scales, theoretically experimentally for decades. By giving the Nobel Prize in physics to those three researchers, actually said that this is settled science because the Nobel Prize for Physics is not given for contentious science. Einstein was not given it for relativity theory. He was given it for the photoelectric effect. So we now have and are in an incredibly exciting moment where all of these experiments and the theoretical underpinning and framing of a universe that meaningfully exists and purposefully evolves as a non-locally unified entity, a living universe, a conscious universe, where we are its microcosmic co-creators. What an adventure we are being invited into. And this is an adventure that IONS have been one of the leading, if not the leading pioneer to help us understand and experience and embody what I refer to, to unitive consciousness. We actually now have a unitive narrative. We're a storytelling species. We have a new and unitive narrative, it seems to me, that underpins and frames the potential for transformation and conscious evolution. Thank you, Jude. Yeah, well, to remind our our audience that IONS, when we began 50 years ago, we had a guess our working hypothesis that everything you just said is probably true. And we're working towards that way from the outside of science. And now, as you said, there's a convergence happening so that what we were projecting would happen is in fact unfolding almost before us as we speak. So happily, Jonathan has joined us. Uh, Let's check uh, if you go off a mute to see if we can hear you. Greetings, can you hear me? I, yes, we can. Okay, so the 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 first question now for the the panel discussion was, uh, in your opinion, what do you think is the best model that we have now for non-local forms of consciousness? An easy question. <laughs> well, uh, I would say that um, I would have to say I don't really think we have yet a best model. I think that we are in a period of still trying to figure out how consciousness behaves in a non-local manner. And let me just say, the first time that I met Dean was at the IONS campus, and I was very excited. I had just uh, discovered a new uh, precognitive effect, uh, which was that essentially if you primed something, it increased perceptual fluency. And, and, and Dean le- listened very patiently. And then he said, have you replicated it? Uh, and I said, well, yes, we replicated once. He said, keep replicating it, it will decline. And this was the uh, very first time that I'd ever heard of the uh, decline effect. And I was rather dismissive of it. That seemed sort of like a ridiculous thing. But sure enough, um, I, we replicated, attempted to replicate it 15 times and, and it did decline. And I have um, experienced a decline, not only with uh, parapsychological findings, but also with uh, conventional findings. Although my conventional findings t- typically decline to um, some place above zero, whereas my the parapsychological findings that I've had have declined all the way to uh, zero. And, and some of you may know that uh, even though uh, I had never heard of the decline effect when uh, Dean first introduced me to it, I have since become a a, a big uh, believer that there is something about collective consciousness where somehow beginner's luck seems to be a part of it. When we do studies initially, we get really sort of remarkable effects and uh, for some reason, I've referred to this as cosmic habituation. Um, it, it's hard to know what's going on. Something happens, and these effects get uh, smaller. And I think that the decline effect, uh, we we did a big, giant, multi-million dollar study, uh, essentially looking at um, uh, d- discovering new effects and then watching them um, decline as they were replicated. And then we actually included a 
key variable of observation. For half the studies, we observed the, the finding after its confirmation and all the replications. And for the other half, we waited uh, until the uh, all the studies had been done. And the effect was significant at the 0 0.10 level. So uh, significant one-tailed, but not two-tailed in the predicted direction. So unfortunately, the paper submitted to uh, Nature does not include uh, does not make hay of this effect, but I, I think that this effect is real, and that when whatever kind of uh, non-local consciousness uh, theories ultimately come out there, uh, we need to integrate uh, the decline effect into it. It's a bit like Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance, but kind of the opposite. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's going to be a factoid that, or a, a probabiloid that's going to be need to be included. Yeah. I agree. And it's so what's interesting about the uh, the decline effect is that it appears to have something to do with observation. And well, so does the the idea of quanta. It's the, the quantum observer effect. It's like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The more you look at something, the more, more and more difficult it is to actually see it combined with the wave particle duality of light. So there's something about the nature of observation that is changing something out there. And perhaps the more subtle the effect that you're looking at, like most psi effects are relatively subtle, you look at it too, too carefully and it begins to go away and pop up somewhere else. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the second question, which is what is the relevance or importance of noetic sciences and studying these kinds of effects, non-local effects? So I'll toss it back up to Teresa. Uh, let me count the ways. And just listening to you two, Jude and Jonathan, I feel I'm growing in intelligent. I can't match your science speak at all, but I'm just going to speak from the heart and from my readers who come from all walks of life. And sometimes the science is hard to understand if you come from that perspective. But from my perspective here right now, I'm looking at the chat coming in and people saying things like my heart is opening. So even if you're not understanding everything, people out there listening because I'm not I'm going to listen back your heart is opening right that's what is happening just listening to these awesome people is helping you grow so listen listen to what they say listen to it back but to answer your question Adine from my perspective it helps me feel liberated and free it helps me understand that I'm more than I can imagine I could ever be and I'm not limited to what I'm consciously experiencing right here on right now knowing that my life isn't defined in entirely material terms and that my life is about finding myself uh, rather than creating myself and this awareness that outer change starts from within in my world it's you know my popular podcast world and when I talk to celebrities and, and the media it's manifesting we're talking about here. It does give your life deeper, greater meaning and that inner strength to work through painful, tough times. Life isn't easy. But if you have that, what Irons is, is helping people to understand, you don't feel like a reed blown in the wind anymore, getting your validation from externals. Your inner world and the choices you make becomes your compass. And it's utterly liberating because you've shifted from existing to feeling alive and it also suggests that your inner world your consciousness may not end after bodily death at all offering relief to the bereaved I get so many people messaging me with their afterlife stories and dreams you know and it's so wonderful now I can point them to the research at ions and offer them comfort that death ends a life not a relationship Additionally, it offers us all the ability to mentally time travel, to comfort our past, be there for ourselves in the past, but also challenge our potential future self, discovering in the process that we are vast, infinite, and the great adventure is directly experiencing this vastness and value, while at the same time knowing you are truly, madly, deeply interconnected with everyone and everything knowing that the real hope for humanity resides in the power of collective inner transformation and the earth-shattering empathy, compassion and intuition it can unleash. That's game-changing, not just individually, but for the collective. Now, I'm perhaps best known these days as a dream work author, and in my humble and, un well, obviously biased opinion, dreams are the door, an instantly accessible entry point 
to this infinite awareness of your vastness beyond your body and brain, time and space, for want of a better word, as my background is in theology too, your soul. But of course, there are other ways to become aware of consciousness beyond your brain. And over time, and as noetic research inevitably filters in the mainstream, I pray that discovering your noetic signature pioneered by the amazing Dr. Wabe, becomes as readily accessible a self-help tool as the Maya Briggs test, personality test, for example. Surpassing it even, for without awareness of your own inner world, your own infinite potential beyond the material, and how best you can harness it for both personal and greater good, everything else is empty and without substance, a clashing symbol, a noisy gong. The world has recently been gripped by this Titan disaster. Now, as deeply, deeply tragic as it is, it is yet another reminder to us all that no amount of external exploration or wealth can ever be as important as the adventure within. And ION's founder, Edgar Mitchell, proved that life hack loud and clear. He walked on the moon, people, but it was his experience of transcendent interconnection that was the true adventure of his life. Such a deeply relevant meaning here that the purpose and adventure we seek out there isn't there at all. It's already within ourselves, within our grasp, right here, right now, this moment. So to conclude, as brevity is the soul of wit, one day I dream that because of the visionary research IONS pioneers and scientists promotes, the first question, rather than the last question, as it sadly still is, everybody asks as the sun rises on the miracle gift of each new day is, what should it profit me to gain the world and lose my soul? Thank you, Teresa. Okay, let's go to Jude. And it looks like we have about eight minutes left. So maybe a four minute wrap up, if that's possible. Why is studying non-local consciousness important? Because we are non-local consciousness. <laughs> it's who we are. So it's actually about experiencing and exploring that fundamental nature of not just our own microcosmic reality, but the reality of our universe, which, as I said earlier, you know, the Nobel Prize has just been given for universal non-locality. So we're in a time where all that IONS has worked for for so long and inspired by Edgar's own noetic experience is actually coming into much, much more of a clarity and a realization. And, you know, our worldviews drive our behaviors. We've, we've been within a, a collective worldview of materialism and separation, as Dean, you mentioned, and as, as Claudia mentioned. And that now, the evidence now, and I think this is why it's a game changer, the evidence now is turning that on its head. But it's doing so not just of importance to scientists. It's not just showing that this is the case um, at scales that are huge or tiny or out there. As Teresa just said, this is potentially transforming us on an inner and outer level because it's showing us that not only do we have a perception of inner meaning, but the whole universe embodies existential meaning and evolutionary purpose. So this, it, you know, this really transforms our abilities to live our lives. You know, I sometimes talk that, say that intuition is our superpower. Intuition has no place in a paradigm of materialism and separation. It has a natural place within this emergent new understanding. Supernormal phenomena also have a natural, there are natural heritage, there are natural attributes as microcosmic non-local consciousnesses within our, our universe. Um, synchronicities, I mentioned a synchronicity with Teresa and, and myself right up at the beginning. You know, again, these have no place in that old materialistic paradigm. They have a wondrous place, a way show of place, a fun place, a joyous place within this emergent understanding. And I agree with Jonathan, this is a work in progress. And yet is a work in progress that has such convergence and convergence that is accelerating even over these last couple of years. So I think we're in an incredibly, not just exciting time, but an existential 
time because this is our moment of choice. Do we choose, sorry, do we choose still to be within that old paradigm of materialism and separation, which is completely unsustainable and now we know is fundamentally wrong? Or do we wake up to remember we're inseparable, you know, from each other, our planetary home guide, the whole universe, and guided by pioneers such as ions, help us to experience that wonder in our lives, everyday lives for each and every one of us, because this is our heritage and this is our invitation um, of evolutionary potential. Thank you, Jude. Uh, Jonathan, you have the last word. Why is this kind of research important, especially for non-local consciousness? So uh, I, as people may have uh, inferred, I come from a very uh, mainstream uh, background. And in, in, in mainstream science, uh, even though non-locality in the context of uh, entang physical physics entanglement is recognized non-locality in terms of consciousness is still largely dismissed as a superstition and um uh, uh, un, not genuine science and i think that ions has done uh really an outstanding job of of, of carrying the torch uh during um a, a period of uh of, of great skepticism. But at, at the same time, and it's so important because we all have experienced synchronicities, not many of us have, but things that seem absolutely uh, inexplicable uh, through a, a material materialist uh, perspective. And so reconciling those uh, seemingly self-evident phenomenological experiences of uh, non-locality and somehow of meaning that doesn't seem to be explained in the material sense. Explaining that and reconciling that with the scientific worldview seems utterly, utterly important. And I think uh, IANS has really done um, a, a great job of, of, of forcing mainstream science to, to acknowledge uh, this disparity. But at the same time, I think that it's not just a matter of uh, mainstream science not taking uh, the, our findings the findings seriously, that there are some really, really curious things about the way that, uh, that parapsychological things enter the world. I have been tending to think that at the end of the day, we may come to find that, and the way I like to put it colloquially is magic is local that we each can experience magical things and synchronicities. As scientists, we can discover individual things, but for some reason, when we try to line them all up together into a sufficiently compelling story so that mainstream science will have to take it uh, to task, it somehow disintegrates. And that that may be part of the process. Uh, and that rather than sort of dismissing that, we should try to explore how could it be that magic is local? How, why is this? And so I think that this is a really uh, important direction to consider and, and maybe even celebrate because it may be that even as wonderful as this non-locality is that we don't want it to be commercialized and you know to, to, to be used in all sorts of possibly uh, devious ways. And there may be some way the system is built that that, that can't be done, which may actually be to benefit. So um, I invite us to, at the same time, celebrate our individual experiences of the noetic, uh, push the scientific mainstream to try to address these phenomena, but also recognize that they may be remarkably sublime, and there may be some ways in which they never line up in the way that other kind of scientific mm -hmm. findings do. Yes, yes, I actually agree that if you, you look at parables and fairy tales, whenever their, their uh, wishes are unleashed upon the world, it falls apart real fast. So there, there may be some kind of governing principle that prevents the universe from exploding and nevertheless, the phenomena are real. So as you're saying, there's there are clues about what's going on here. And if we're clever enough, maybe we can figure out uh, how to interpret those clues. So I, I wanna thank uh, Teresa and Jude and Jonathan for their comments on this panel. And I guess the time is up, so we're, we go back to Andrea. 
Great. Yes. Thank you so much for this panel. And as we say at IONS, both the experience and the science, the noetic and the science are so important. So bringing that perspective of the inner experience and all of the science and the philosophy is so wonderful. And so thank you again for this panel. And we are going to go a little bit deeper into the noetic. So our experiential for the day, we are so, so thrilled to introduce you to Louisa Tisch, who will be leading us in a ritual and experiential exercise. And Louisa Tisch is an initiated elder in the Ifa Orisha tra tradition of the African diaspora and is an internationally known for her storytelling, teaching, and spiritual guidance services. Her latest work, A Calabash of Calories, is Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times, is an Amazon Books bestseller. And Louisa Tisch has been an IONS friend, elder, wisdom holder, and collaborator for many years. So Louisa, we are just so, so grateful to have you here with us today and um, passing the stage to you. Thank you, Louisa. I begin by saying a la fia, which is a greeting asking that you have good health and be at peace with your neighbor, which is very important at this point in the history of our planet. I come to you as the resident animus who comes from a tradition wherein we assume that the universe has consciousness. We know that we can talk to every tree and every rock and listen to the sound of the wind and all of the world is alive. So from our point of view, <clears throat> The question that is being asked is not the problem of the universe, but the problem of those of us who are locked in being finite instead of opening ourselves up to connect to the infinite, you know, and understand our relationship to it. So, um, you know, thinking about the guidance that I receive as an Iyanifa that is every year, all the priests of, of our tradition, and we have temples in 100 countries, get together and perform divination to find out what guidance we can provide to people to put us in accord with the will of the universe, the direction, the way that things are going. And interestingly enough, the message that has come through recently is that we must expand our consciousness before we ask for anything, okay? So the way we're presently thinking and feeling is smaller, is tighter, is more closed off than the spirits or the Orishas want to give us, you know? We are facing a time of change where we have to change how we think and what we feel in order to be able to receive the greater good. So given that message from, um, from the divinities, the best offering that I can make to you today, I feel, is an exercise or what we call an ori blessing, okay? Now, if, if, if you all remember or have seen a child born, there is a soft spot right in the top of the head, okay? This we call ipori, and by that we mean that is the place where your share of universal energy is entering your skull, okay? If you go from there, right here between your brow, this is what we call iwaju, the eye of character. Here is where you have imagination and vision and optimism. And it is through Iwaju that you know what your relationship to the universe is, okay? If you start here and go down the back of your neck to that place where your neck meets your spine, that is the place called Eshu Niapako, the trickster who is a troublemaker because that's the borderline between the energy coming in your vision and your ability to run it through your arms into your hands and make it material reality. Every artist knows what I'm talking about. 
out of nowhere comes this vision, this image, this image, this energy. And then when it's time to put it on the canvas or put it in the soil, we run into trouble because we prefer optimism over pessimism. We prefer connection over isolation and empowerment over weakness. We give more strength to Iwaju than we do to the trickster. So I want to invite everybody, if you have water close to you, I have water and light, which are the two things that uh, they say the spirit always requires. If you don't have water, I want you to gather the moisture from the atmosphere that you are presently in. Gather the moisture that is in the air, gather the moisture that is in your own body. For those of you who have an external source of water, you wanna take the tallest finger on your left hand and dip it in the water and touch this spot here. Iwaju, which some call the third eye, and open that path so that there is light emanating from that eye. You want to touch the top of your head, Ipori, and see the energy radiating from the universe, your share of it entering your head. And I don't just mean your brain there, but it's entering your consciousness. And then dip your finger in the water again and touch the back of your neck and come to understand the guidelines, the boundaries of what you can actually create, okay? What you can turn into material reality. All of it is there, the connection is there, but there's a limit to how much you can turn into material reality. The most important thing though, is when we do this, we take the vision over the top of the head, receive more universal energy, and then go down into that place where we're gonna turn things into physical reality. And what we say here is, ori migbamio, which means my head supports me. My head supports me. My head supports me. And sometimes we do this every morning so that you become clear about what part of universal will are you to manifest today. It's often said that, you know, the deities of all the galaxies, all the elements of the earth, the surviving uh, intelligence of all the ancestors cannot give you anything that your consciousness will not receive, okay? And the basic message that came through for the reading for this year is before we ask for so much of the future, we must first build up our sense of consciousness, build up our ores, purify, clean our ores from the trauma of the past and the behaviors that we've had before and be open vessels to receive the energy of the new that is coming through. Receive the energy of the new that is coming through. So I want to invite everybody, when you get ready to do your research, when you're ready to start your day, when you're trying to figure out how do I expand my consciousness, simply take some moisture and move from Iwaju over the top of the head, down the back of the neck, and then sit quietly and allow the vision to come to you. Thank you for your time and your attention.
you, Louisa, incredible practice and the wisdom tradition that you hold. And as mentioned, just so important that we have these ways that we can connect with the noetic in whatever way and with the science. So thank you for offering your practice and your perspective and your wisdom. We're, we're so grateful. Yeah, we're so grateful. And what a beautiful practice to bring us into um, any point where we want to call in that alignment. So thank you, dear Louisa. And um, so we've already had so many amazing conversations and now this experience, and we are going to go into the time where we talk about our award, the Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Research Award. So we are really excited to announce our winners, um, be able to see the presentations that won the award and then have a panel discussion about it. So first I want to introduce you to Dr. Arnold DeLorme who will be talking about the process for determining the winner of the award and a little bit of background before we transition to the award winners. So Arno, thanks for being with us. And Arno is a, just a couple sentences about your background. Arno is a CNRS principal investigator in Toulouse, France, a faculty member at the University of California, San Diego, and a scientist here at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Starting in 2002, he began to look at brain changes underlying extraordinary states of consciousness, including meditation, psychoactive agents, and mediumship. And he is the author of over 160 peer reviewed publications. So Arno, passing it on to you now. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Andrea. So um, as Andrea mentioned, I'm going to uh, give some background about the price and what is the price about uh, uh, anyway. And uh, first I want to mention uh, our pa paper we published uh, last year what if consciousness is not an emergent property of the brain? And so that's a paper we've published with Elane Dean and our PhD student, Cedric Canar. And we set the stage to uh, test hypotheses that uh, basically go outside of mainstream. In mainstream, as Dean mentioned, consciousness emerge uh, from the brain. And what if it's not the case? So that's really what started this whole prize. And this paper... Uh, I have uh, uh, colleagues in mainstream academia. We talked to me about this paper. Uh, it, it's got massive interest. If you, this is altmetric, so this is uh, among all research paper of all disciplines, uh, physics, biology, and neuroscience. And you see this one is in the top 5%. So a lot of people are actually interested in, the, in that question. And so we publish uh, the paper and... Um, and then uh, we were uh, lucky that uh, Linda uh, decided to uh, set up that price. And she asked us, what should the price uh, be about? And so um, we gathered with our jury, and I'm going to show you the jury in the next uh, slide. And we came up with this specific wording. We want to be the prize for experiments testing scientifically the hypothesis that consciousness is more than an emergent property of the brain. It's the proposal of an experiment. People don't have to do the experiment. So why did we use that wording? First, we wanted people to propose an experiment that is testable. We didn't want people to give another theory because the problem with the consciousness theories is a lot of them are not testable. So we wanted uh, um, an experiment, which could be attached to a theory, but we wanted first and foremost an experiment. Second, uh, you see, that is a more than an emergent property of the brain. We didn't want to constrain people into like uh, using a specific hypothesis. The only uh, criteria that was, it was just not an emergent property of the brain. Uh, and by this, uh, we meant, uh, Tin already explained that, that basically when, if consciousness is an emergent property of the brain, consciousness is an illusion and uh, consciousness is not real. Uh, um, and so I won't come back uh, to that. So, so we set up this jury. So we were the four uh, ions uh, scientists. Uh, so Enane, Dean, I, and Gary was a molecular biologist. I'm a neuro neuroscientist. Dean is everything. He has all the hats, uh, experimental psychology, a physicist, and Elan is a clinical uh, psychologist. And then um, we contacted people in our field and and set of this jury, we have Bruce Dammer, Dammer, 
uh, with evolutionary biologist Martin Schlitz, uh, who uh, was the former uh, CEO of IONS and also uh, anthropologist Roger Nelson, who set up the Global Consciousness Project and uh, is very uh, renowned in the field of sci research. Uh, we also have uh, Stanley Krippner, who has written many books, uh, and uh, especially on, he has experiments on dream telepathy. Peter Benzel, who is a physicist and also renowned sci researcher. Jessica Hutz, who is a st statistician and was the former president of the American Statistical Association. And Patricio Tresoldi, who is a professor in Italy and also a very renowned uh, sci researcher. So we set up the jury panel and uh, we set up this call and we got about a 108 uh, proposal, and we judge this proposal based on the scientific rigor, uh, whether the experiment was feasible, uh, whether the, it was relevant to the topic we wanted to be uh, actual about consciousness and, but, and about the potential impact. If the experiment is successful, uh, what impact will we have in the field? And among this 108 proposal, we uh, we came up with 10 proposals, and then these 10 proposals went into phase two, and in phase two, uh, uh, people were asked to write a longer proposal. In phase one, uh, it was just uh, one page, one page and a half uh, of the description of the experiments, and in phase two, it was more than uh, 10 pages. So uh, we asked uh, 10 of the uh, people, 10 of the uh, um, uh, uh, applicants to send a longer proposal. And among these 10 proposals, we gathered again with our jury and uh, we tried to pick who would be the winner. And there uh, we got a, a, a problem is we couldn't pick a winner. And, and I think we'll come back on, on that. But uh, uh, there were three proposals that were obviously uh, on the top. And uh, what we decided is that we were going to uh, split the price between uh, these three uh, proposals. So um, now I'm going to uh, give the floor to Elane, uh, right, who is going to uh, present the winners. Great. And thank you, Arno, for that update and kind of leading everyone through this proposal phase. And we are actually going to show a video now with Linda G. O'Brien. As you mentioned, she is the one that made this award possible and the furthering of the field possible. So let's um, cue up that video. So just one moment, the video. Noetic science is the study of consciousness and its relationship to the physical world and investigates if and how humans might influence our personal and collective reality, not only with our behaviors, but with our thoughts and beliefs, with our attitudes and emotions. Are we separate from each other, from nature and from the rest of the cosmos? Or is all life deeply interconnected as many feel is consciousness a product of the human brain or something more primary and causal in the universe? In what's been called a near-death experience for our planet, we're participating in a dynamic tension playing out between two paradigms based on two competing worldviews. As ION's founder, NASA astronaut and sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell observed from space, we're all in this together and we need to start behaving like it. The Noetic Sciences equips humanity with a more holistic view of consciousness in a way that can, in the words of futurist Buckminster Fuller, convert humankind's tendency toward oblivion into a realization of our potential. Within this context, visionary board member Linda O'Brien and IONS have established the Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Research Prize to help address these questions, shift the current scientific paradigm, and build the field of noetic sciences. I'm here today as a board member, a longtime donor, and chair of the IONS Development Committee. With the recent sale of IONS campus, we are now able to seed its first multi-million dollar endowment 
This will help to provide financial security for IONS in many generations to come. As we head into our 50th anniversary, IONS is a solid nonprofit. During COVID, scientific research accelerated and experiential programming participants quadrupled, with IONS' sole purpose being of service to humanity and our planet. I have been thoughtfully reviewing this past year and contemplating what do I want my legacy to be. And today I am delighted to announce that I have established the Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Research Prize. This annual prize of $100,000 is designed to provide IONS worldwide visibility. The prize will be given to an external individual or team who has proven research to advance leading edge science around consciousness. It is my hope that this prize will yield discovery. And as my dear friend and mentor, Mary Morrissey said to me, what if one of those ideas could change the world? I genuinely believe that together we can open both the financial and energetic pathways to a flourishing planet that embraces our interconnection with all. Thank you. And thank you for your support of IONS. give a warm, warm, so much gratitude to Linda G. O'Brien and her generosity. And um, this is the moment we have been waiting for. So we are going to announce our award winners for this year. They're here with us today and will give us a presentation here about their awards. Um, and to announce the awards is Helene Wabe. So let me just introduce Helene to our webinar stage. So Dr. Helene Wabe is the Director of Research here at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University. She has published on and spoken internationally about her studies on complementary and alternative medicine, mind-body medicine, extended human capacities, and is especially known for her research around a noetic approach to channeling. So yes, this is the moment we've been waiting for. Helene, let me pass it off to you now. Thank you so much, Andrea. And it is so exciting for me to be here today on this long awaited day. And I have the incredible privilege of being able to announce the winners to you. So what I'm going to do is to announce the winners one by one. And then after all the winners are announced, we'll move into uh, presentations where the winners actually get to share with you about their testable theory of consciousness. So without further ado, on behalf of IONS and the Linda G. O'Brien Noetic Sciences Research Prize, the first winner is for the proposal, detecting deviations from random activity as indications of consciousness beyond the brain. And the winners are Wolfhart Yanu, Vasilios Bastios, Pierre Francesco Moretti, Peter Mary, Annette Gratha, and Vicente Arez. Please have a warm virtual round of applause for this incredible team. Wonderful, thank you. So you'll have a, a time to speak in a moment. So I'm now announcing the second proposal winner. Particle physics arising from conscious agents. The winners are Donald Hockman, Chaitan Prakash, and Shaypan Chatterjee. Congratulations. Please have a virtual round of applause for this incredible proposal and team. Thank you. 
And finally, our third winner, the proposal is Seeing Without Eyes. And the winner was Alex Gomad Marin. Congratulations, Alex. Virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're so excited uh, for these teams and we are even more excited for you to hear about the way that they approached this prize because there really were so many incredible ways that people envisioned being able to test non-local consciousness theories. So we're going to begin with the Wolfhart Janus uh, proposal. And so uh, you'll have about 20 minutes or so to share about your proposal. Just a moment. Um, yeah, you must screen. Yes, you can see it. Okay, okay. Um, so I think we. I'm very, first of all, my team and I we are very very honored to to be here today, and um, especially because we 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 started did some kind of research just some um, three years ago. And it's also an honor that the method we developed and the team we formed up around this method and about this um, research is now honored by this prize. So I would say I will, I will start with a short introduction into to our work. Of course, um, it's much to um, little time to bring you the details, but I think it's enough to bring you a good overview of what we did, what our technique is based upon, is based on, and of course, um, what are our ideas to prove that that consciousness cannot be in the brain. So, I think I will start now what we did far. So actually, we, in, we investigated in a series of tantra seminars if during tantric rituals, synchronous patterns appear in REG data. So there will be a short introduction to that in a, in a few slides. And then as a, a second um, point of interest, which, which just started um, approximately one year ago, we investigated if during the dying process, synchronous patterns appear in REG data around the moment of death. So. That is our setup, and this is it's called the original setup because we so our Saturday's scientific um, Zoom meeting is called the original meeting. And what is new to this setup is that we have two independent REGs. These are random number event generators, so you can imagine them as um, uh, coin electronic coin flipping machines. So we have two of them on one laptop, or you can also have it on two laptops. It matters. So we test all these things. And we are scanning these um, random data um, on synchronous patterns. So now you see what a classical materialist would expect um, um, out of such experiments. A classical materialist, from this viewpoint, you would just expect two independent plots inside this um, red parabola. The parabola is the border of significance. This is a uh, this is more or less baseline data, and they were recorded in German hotels under um, blank value conditions. And now, of course, the interesting question is, what did we find during the tantra seminar or later on during the process of dying? And short introduction to the technique. So, what we are doing actually? Um, so, this is mainly based on on. So the idea to take two RHCs is based on intuition and then a little bit of luck. And then of course, two years of hard work. So this is now, what is the result of this hard work? Um, so we programmed, so I programmed a software which is searching these two random number um, event generator output streams, which you can um, plot in random box for 
certain kind of patterns. So I'm searching actually the data fully automated um, for, for, for significant synchronous patterns. That means if, for example, Alice and Bob, so the two confetti machines, flip both at the same time more, more um, once, so and leaving the parabola, this would be one significant pattern. Another one would be, of course, if one are one coin flipping machine plots it significantly more once. Then, when, and at the same time, the other coin um, coin tossing machine um, is tossing more zeros. So then, also you will get a significant pattern. And the third one, and I think this is only visible if you take um, two random number event generators, um, um, you can find that. One is both are not significant alone, but they're but both together are significant because the minimum distance between the random walks gets significantly small. You can imagine this that the two are sticking together for um, for a significant long time. And of course, as random number event generators or coin flip machines are based on statistics, you can easily calculate the value how unlikely um, a certain pattern appears. So. Oh. Um, we get for each signal um, a signal like graph and output. So we have a software. Um, the software sends through the whole run to the um, through the data streams and finds significant patterns. And and the thing is, um, the software itself um, scans for the starting point. Yeah, that means um, we do not. If we have, for example, an a, a tantric ritual. Um, we write down during this ritual what, what happened at the ritual, what was maybe what was the starting point, where, where there have been the emotional highlights or the deep moments, meaningful moments. This is one thing. But the other thing is that then software fully automatically says where from the data point of view significant points are and where do they start. So the, um, the software leads to a segmentation of the data just out of the data themselves. We do not have any manual segmentation if we analyze the data. And what you see here is the resultant plot. So the height of this peak it is just an example of one of my, actually this is my first country grid while I investigated. What you see here is, um, you know, like graph, it looks more like the output of an electronic instrument, but of course it is not, yeah, it's significant. Significance that two random number event generators um, produce a synchronicity. So you see the dashed lines. This means the starting point of all the significant dates that are there, where, where you see the point and dashed line. And then, of course, you have the peak height, which is just, um, which, which represents the unlikelihood that the pattern just appears by chance. Huh? And the starting point and height leads to a segmentation of the data just driven by the structure of the random box. So, this is the application on our first country grid row. We have 24 hours of data, and you see that we have one very high peak here with a with the starting point represented by the dashed line. This is just reproduced by the data. Yeah. And if we then go zoom into that, we see that I wrote down three events during during this um withdrawal day one, two, and three, and that uh, event three, where I wrote down here, the ritual is starting because the, sem because the person who led the seminar, the tantric seminar said, okay, well, not, now we are starting, yeah, is exactly the same as the software found just out of the data. So we have two interesting things. We have the story of the ritual, the qualitative story, and we have the story of the data. And these, these, these are correlating. So you can see here um, on the on the lower on the lower right, you see the pattern which was recovered by the algorithm. And now you see the pattern which occurs with the manual segmentation I did during the seminar. And these are the same. So actually this is showing that we can, with this methodology, we can we can we can um, we have a synchronicity in the data at events which are very meaningful for a particip participating people. So, and there's another interesting finding. So investigate, I, we investigated more of these seminars, and this is a comparison of the same ritual structure, like two different occasions with different people. This is very interesting because the people were different. The experience level was different, so the, the lower one um, was performed by more experienced people. 
one possible interpretation, actually, this is my favorite one, that the repetition of a structure which generates similar qualias and therefore has a similar web of meaningful events, what is similar structure in RHG data? This is just interpretation of that. But I think the a ritual is there to reproduce a certain mood, a certain purpose. Yeah? And this, this state and this comparison um, less um, to a similarity and a um, um, synchronicity of the RHG data. So, oh. and it's actually our idea from the Linda O'Brien Prize. So we asked the question, yeah, um, what we have a non-local measurement because the synchronicity patterns are definitely and non-local properties. But we measured the local events. So what is causing a non-local measurement to be coupled to a local event? And this cannot, cannot be the distance in space time. It must be something else. And we think it's just the closeness in the noetic space of consciousness, which, which um, connects the meaningful relation that divides the measured event. So we thought, OK, if we now have such a, um, a device in Vienna and Austria, and we perform something, a, a connection ritual, between the device in Austria and country events in, uh, in Berlin, then actually we should find the same significant data and the, 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 um, and, and the same significant patterns during meaningful events as we would find um, if the device would be placed locally in Germany. So our second proposal, we have, we have a project in an intensive, intensive care unit in Spain and in a hospice in Scotland, where we are monitoring um, the moment of death. So people which are, which are, which are come close to this moment, um, we ha have a local um, array device there. And we found in our data um, very hard evidence that we see in this data exactly when, when, when the people are passing. And so um, as we know the moment of death and as, the, as we also know the emotional circumstances around that, so the people in, 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 uh, are documenting more psychological data around this moment, um, we see that death has a non-local aspect, which is very, very interesting. And so we said, okay, um, what is if we have, again, um, a device in Vienna, and we just connect the device to the intensive care unit in, in LG in Spain, just by a connection withdrawal. And the connection withdrawal is something intuitive, you know? Um, so we, we said, okay, we will, we, in this case, we'll have a photo of the room of the patient, and we, and we, we just um, do something like um, a, a meaningful contract between this, Space in Spain and the device in Vienna. In the tantric, for the tantric ritual, we decided, okay, if we have a photo of the device in Vienna, um, we, 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 will, we will just invite the group to feel the device, and then we will look if it just monitors the data as it was, would, would be locally there. And the nice thing on this is we also can have a control experiment because we have four devices in the same room. So they share the space time in Vienna. We will roll a dice, which of the devices will be connected by a connection ritual. Then we perform the connection ritual, and then we should see the difference between the plot of the connected device and the control process of the, of the non-connected device. And the connection means psychologically connected, psychologically closed in the noetic space of consciousness. So um, this is our weird research we had research team. Um, so I think, um, so it's, of course, I'm photo of myself, Dr. Nete Kratov, Dr. Vitjen Jarez, who is leading the project in Spain, Vasilius Basios, the physicist of Belgium, Peter Mary, who initiated a lot of the things um, regarding weird research, and um, our another physicist, um, Pierre Francesco Moretti. And I think you can imagine that we have a lot of deep discussions 
what the what's the results are telling us. But actually, for us, it's too early to come to a to a final conclusion what consciousness is about. So we are now in the process just of designing experiments and collecting data. So, and these are some ideas for our future. Um, so um, learning the, the, the code of Qualia by applying the current analysis to all available random data, because we just have 10 bits per second now, and we could have 300,000 seconds. But actually, um, the calculation power we have now in our computers is much too slow to do that. Of course, we also have the, the idea that we get the full information of the field of consciousness in the process of dying and in human interaction. And I think also a very interesting idea would be to decode the field of consciousness during seances. Look what we can read out of the data. So the main question is, does the pattern or the shape of the pattern in the qualia corresponds, also in the data corresponds to certain qualia? But this is of course a question we will hopefully come closer to an answer in the future. So thank you for your attention and maybe some nice pictures. So um, you can join us at the Science of Consciousness with time. So that this, this year is the topic is time in the Broughton Sanctuary. Um, if you ever have asked yourself where the pair equipment um, is now, the, the, the equipment of the former pair lab is there in the weird experience where you can um, see a picture um, of the of Murphy, the random mechanical cascade. Yeah, and all other information you can find it at Weird. And I think it's important also to mention that we are a big team, um, heavily intertwined also with ICL and 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 the Broken Sanctuary. And we are all very proud to be, to want to be one of the winners of this great prize. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. And it's exciting to see the approach that you're taking with these devices to be able to um, see if we can objectively measure in some way these changes uh, in the field and consciousness and these big events. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I know we, we don't give uh, you a whole lot of time. So uh, thank you for summarizing it in that way. So next up, we're gonna hear from Don Hoffman, who is gonna share about his proposal, Particle Physics Arising from Conscious Agents. Take it away. Thank you very much. I'm going to, um, I've got a video that I've made to maximize the use of the time. So I'll show that first. On behalf of Chaitan Prakash and Shwapun Chatterjee, I would like to say thank you to the Institute of Noetic Sciences and to Linda O'Brien for this award. We are most grateful. I will now discuss our proposal. Until recently, science has assumed that space and time, or their union into space-time, is fundamental reality. This has been a remarkably useful framework it is the foundation of quantum field theory, general relativity, and evolution by natural selection. It has led to a wealth of technologies that transform how we live. But many high energy physicists now argue that space time is doomed. It is not fundamental. For example, Nathan Seiberg says, I am almost certain that space and time are illusions. These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Ed Witten says simply, space and time may be doomed. Andrew Strominger says, the notion of space-time is clearly something we're going to have to give up. Nima Arkani Hamed agrees, saying, the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying descriptions of the laws of physics. David Gross explains that space-time is doomed because there is no operational meaning 
to distances smaller than the Planck plane. Why is that? Quantum theory tells us that to see smaller and smaller things, you need greater and greater energy. By the time you reach 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, you cram so much energy into such a small space that gravity creates a black hole. You destroy the very object you want to see. If you try to use more energy, you just make the black hole bigger. Because space-time is doomed, physicalist reductionism is also doomed. As Nima puts it, so the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by some laws at the ultra most microscopic distance scales, and that somehow we just have to go there to see what's going on is ultimately false because of gravity. In the current reductionist paradigm, quarks, leptons, and bosons are considered fundamental particles with behaviors governed by fundamental laws. Larger objects, such as pyramidal neurons, are composed of these particles. Even larger objects, such as brains, are composed of neurons and other cells. Most scientific theories of consciousness still assume the old framework of space-time and reductionism. They assume that elementary particles are fundamental objects within space-time. Particles form macroscopic objects, such as brains. Brains and other objects with the right properties give rise to consciousness or to the illusion of consciousness. However, no physicalist theory has yet explained any one specific conscious experience. For instance, what precise pattern of integrated information must be the taste of chocolate and could not be the taste of vanilla? What precise orchestrated collapse of quantum states in neuronal microtubules must be the sound of a saxophone and could not be the sound of a clarinet? What precise pattern of brain activity must be the illusion of the smell of a rose and could not be the illusion of the smell of a lemon? This failure led Steven Pinker to say, but the last dollop in the theory that subjectively feels like something to be such circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. In other words, the failure is principled. Physicalist theories cannot explain subjective experience or the illusion of subjective experience. They can only stipulate it. The reason is simple. They assume an ontology of space-time and methodology of reductionism. But space-time is doomed and physicalist reductionism is dead. Physicalist theories of subjective feeling must fail because their key assumptions are false. Fortunately, high energy physicists are succeeding in their hunt for new structures beyond space-time and beyond quantum theory. As Nima describes the hunt, so there's some other structure that we're looking for, and some way of thinking about this structure that, that will let us see space-time and quantum mechanics emerge simultaneously and joined at the hip. In this hunt, we need new structures and ideas that don't look anything like anything having to do with particles propagating in space-time and wave functions evolving in Hilbert space. How can we find new structures beyond space-time? One key is scattering experiments. Particle colliders, such as the LHC, smash particles together at high speeds and detect particles that spray out. Theorists predict the probabilities of these scattering events. When they use Feynman diagrams and mathematics that assume space-time is fundamental, the math becomes impossibly complex. For example, the formula for two gluons coming in and scattering to four gluons going out 
is hundreds of pages and billions of terms. But in 2013, uh, Nima and collaborators discovered a geometric object beyond space-time, the amplitude hedron. Its volume encodes scattering amplitudes and can be computed in three or four terms instead of billions. Its structure reveals a hidden symmetry of scattering processes. We learn an important lesson. Let go of space-time and reductionism. Then the math simplifies and new symmetries emerge. Remarkably, the new structures beyond space-time are largely, and sometimes completely, determined by decorated permutations. When you shuffle cards, for instance, you permute their order. Decorated permutations are just regular shuffles with a little mathematical twist added. So high-energy physicists are hunting beyond space-time, and they have found structures such as the amplitudehedron and decorated permutations. But what do they mean? What do these structures tell us? They are like obelisks beyond space-time. Recall the apes in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, that are looking, pounding, and screaming at an obelisk. They know it's full of meaning, but they have no clue. What are these structures trying to tell us? We propose that these static structures are pointing to a dynamics of entities beyond space-time. This dynamics projects onto these static structures and then projects into space-time. In particular, we propose that beyond space-time, there is a vast social network of interacting entities that we call conscious agents. Think of it as like the Twitterverse. There are millions of Twitter users each tweeting and following other users. Each conscious agent has the same structure. First, it has a set of possible experiences, such as the taste of chocolate or the smell of garlic. <clears throat> These experiences are represented mathematically as a probability space. In the Twitter metaphor, we can think of these experiences as the tweets the agent receives. Based on its current experiences, the agent then decides what action to take. This decision is represented mathematically by a Markovian kernel. The set of actions available to the agent also are represented mathematically as a probability space. In the Twitter metaphor, we can think of these actions as like responding to a tweet by liking it, retweeting it, or ignoring it. Once the action has been chosen, the action is then performed. This act is again represented mathematically by a Markovian kernel. The action affects one or more members of the network of conscious agents. In the Twitter metaphor, the network is the entire Twitterverse, and those affected by your actions are those Twitter users that follow you. Once the agent's action has affected the network, the network responds by influencing the agent's next experience. This act is again represented mathematically by a Markovian kernel. This completes the loop. A theory of conscious agents must explain many things, including everything listed here. Our definition of a conscious agent heeds Occam's razor by assuming as little as possible. It only assumes the existence of qualia, that is, of experiences and of actions based on, qual on qualia. Everything else in this list, learning, memory, the self, intelligence, problem solving, must be explained as emerging from networks of interactions among conscious agents. But this can be done in principle because conscious agent networks are computationally universal. Anything that can be computed, for instance, by neural nets, 
can be computed by conscious agent nets. Dynamical interactions of conscious agents. Project down to decorated permutations. Specifically, decorated permutations describe which groups of states of the agent dynamics form recurrent communicating classes of the dynamics, or more generally form communities of the dynamics. These decorated permutations then project to spacetime as described by high energy physics. Spacetime appears as a user interface whereby some agents interact with others. Properties of particles such as mass, momentum, and spin are projections of properties of the recurrent communicating classes. In particular, the momentum corresponds to the number of states in the recurrent class. The mass corresponds to its entropy rate. And the spin follows from the determinant of its Marco Markovian kernel. The experiment we propose tests these predictions for the behavior of quarks and gluons inside protons. Recall that normal matter, such as water, surfboards, and human bodies, is composed of molecules, such as water molecules, which in turn are composed of atoms, such as hydrogen and oxygen atoms, which in turn are composed of electrons and a nucleus, The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, which are themselves composed of quarks and gluons. In the case of protons, two up quarks and one down quark. Scattering experiments with protons have shown that at lower spatial and temporal resolutions, the interior of the proton is dominated by three quarks bound together by gluons. At higher spatial and temporal resolution, the interior of the proton is dominated by a sea of quarks and gluons. And at even higher spatial and temporal resolution, the interior of the proton is primarily just a sea of gluons. This is an informal description of much more precise data, such as shown in these graphs from the HERA project. The goal of our computational experiment is to show that the theory of conscious agents can precisely match the momentum distribution of quarks and gluons at, at all spatial and temporal scales. This would not prove that the theory of conscious agents is right, but it would demonstrate that a theory of consciousness prior to spacetime could accurately model the interior of the proton, and so should be taken seriously. Once we've used the theory of conscious agents to model the interior of the proton, we then need to systematically work our way up, modeling nuclei, atoms, molecules, and macroscopic matter, such as human brains. Then we will be in a position to the neural correlates of conscious experiences. For more mathematical details, on the theory of conscious agents, please see our paper, Fusions of Consciousness, published in 2023 in the journal Entropy. Thank you for your attention, and thank you again to the Institute of Noetic Sciences and to Linda O'Brien for this award. And I'll just say one thing briefly, if I have a moment. Um, at the very end, a, a question that might naturally occur here is why have we chosen? to model the interior of the proton with the, from our theory of conscious agents. Why, for example, didn't we go directly to the brain where we have all these neural correlates of consciousness and all the research that's been done on the neural correlates of consciousness? And, and the answer is because, not because we think that you know, quarks and gluons are the most interesting thing around, they're the simplest thing that we can model. If we're going to start with a model of consciousness outside of space-time, we want to make the cleanest and simplest connection we can make to, to testable things inside space-time. And so for us, 
we, we decided that the quarks and gluons are the simplest things that we could possibly do. Brains are trillions upon trillions upon trillions of cells, which are upon trillions upon trillions of, of particles. So we don't want to go there immediately. We're going to start with the quarks and gluons, show that we can make that connection between consciousness and space-time, and then work our way up. Um, so there's, there's plenty of job security in, in the work ahead. Thank you so much, Don. And I really appreciate the um, clarity and simplicity with which you presented this work, which is very incredibly uh, complex. And so I think it, it makes it very accessible for the general layperson to try to understand exactly what you're doing. And you're right, it is a huge research program uh, where this is just the beginning. So thank you so much for sharing with us about that. And Congratulations again. Thank you so much on behalf of my whole team. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to um, Alex for his proposal, Seeing Without Eyes. All right. I'd like to start by showing the prize, which we didn't yet. So this is how beautiful it is. OK. Well, I wish to dedicate this to Vicente, who's a blind man who's helping me to see beyond. And also my sincere gratitude to Linda G. O'Brien for her generosity and timely initiative and to the Institute of Noetic Sciences for half a century of truly, truly pioneering work. Good, so my proposal is entitled Seeing Without Eyes. And in a way, the title is quite self-explanatory. I want to test the hypothesis that seeing without eyes is possible, and I don't mean it in a metaphorical sense, I mean it in a literal sense. And so it is as simple as it sounds, and at the same time, it is a strong claim. So I would like, if you allow me, to read you the summary of my proposal, it's just 200 words, as an invitation to actually read the entire essay, which is more than 30 pages, but it's, it's written so that lay people, as well as experts, can appreciate it. So here's the summary. If minds are nothing but the activity of brains, then the perception of external objects without mediation of the five senses should be impossible. However, if it was shown that humans can see without their physical eyes, such extraocular vision, let's call it, would not only challenge the prevailing materialistic scientific paradigm, but actually refute it. Our main hypothesis is that seeing without eyes is possible, not just metaphorically, but literally. Building upon scattered evidence of the phenomenon across different schools in time, we propose a series of tightly controlled experiments to effectively elicit and rigorously measure extraocular vision in talented individuals, especially blind people. In addition to prove, providing strong empirical evidence, we highlight the importance of theoretical work to give us reasons to believe the data. Anomalous cognition in one framework can become quite normal, not so anomalous, but quite normal in another. Frame within a Jamesian, William James, Jamesian theory of brain function, whereby the brain would permit consciousness rather than produce it. Our proposal can demonstrate that you are more than your brain. Ironically, let's not forget, we need to go beyond the brain, but also we must come back to the brain as a privileged organ that can give us clues about the difficult marriage between mind and matter. All right, so what am I doing here? What I'm doing is extending the notion of the extended mind, taking it seriously. As you know, since Descartes, we've been suffering the wounds of a really difficult divorce between res cogitans and res extensa, between soul and body, between mind and matter. Well, the extended mind, which is accepted not, not only in the orthodoxy, but in the, in the heterodoxy of cognitive science, has been making waves over the last 25 years. And what I'm asking is, well, does it need extension? Can we extend the extended mind? What does that mean? Well, it means that we ask the following question. Do we see the objects, the objects of the outside world inside our head? Or do we see those objects right there where they appear to be? So is our mind really extended? Is it extended plus, perhaps non-local? And if so, then seeing without eyes may be possible. 
Okay, the subtitle of my proposal is, I believe, also quite telling. It is climbing up the impossibility ladder with controlled experiments in talented individuals. Let me break this for you. Climbing up. Well, climbing up because it is an, it's an effort, but not only an effort, it is a struggle as a, and a, quite a difficult one for reasons I'll come to, to, to at the end. And, and this community knows quite well what I mean. It's really a struggle to study these things, not just because they're hard scientifically, but also sociologically. The impossibility ladder. Well, the word impossible here, it's key. Here's a sad joke. So here you come with the data and say, hey, check the data. And then the person replies, oh, very good. But is it possible in theory, right? What does that mean? That evidence alone, and you need to bring good evidence, strong evidence, will not make it. We need reasons to believe in that evidence. And then the second part of the subtitle, controlled experiments in talented, in talented individuals. Well, we need tight, and I agree, tighter controls than what's been done um, in, in the experiences that are around, that has, have to do with seeing with our eyes. But here I want to name the elephant in the room of those who believe that seeing without eyes is possible, which is that there's often trickery. Yes, there is. So we need tight controls. And so we need to address the concerns of the skeptics, not when they become stubbornly dogmatic, but skeptics has a place. Now, in talented individuals, well, we need also to attend and integrate the claims of the believers. And so we need to find those, those talented individuals who claim they can do such things. And they are around, they're perhaps difficult to find, but we need to find them and engage with them. And why are they important? Well, another joke, because droning is not a proof that swimming is impossible. And very often we say, well, let's try it in a population. It doesn't work, therefore it's impossible. Well, perhaps we need to try it in people who can actually do it. So this is very important because as somebody asked me the other day, hey, Alex, but do you really believe in this? And I would say, it's complicated as a scientist, yes and no. Maybe an answer is on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I believe in these things, and on Tuesday and Thursday, I don't. And so among skeptics, I doubt, sorry, among skeptics, I believe, and, among, and amongst believers, I must, I must doubt. And this is <laughs> emotionally complicated as well. All right, let me tell you a story of how I ended up interested in this, because you can read a lot of the details in the proposal. So. I had a near-death experience in 2021. I was really low on, on, on energy, as you can imagine. And as I started recovering, weeks and months went by. And the first book I could read was this book by Jacobo Grimberg, the Mexican neurophysiologist who disappeared in 1994. And I was reading that because I was interested in theories of consciousness. And by the way, Jacobo had a theory before the Anglo-American world decided that the history of the science of consciousness started in, in the 90s. Well, way, way before there, there were theories of consciousness. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Jacobo had also been doing some really crazy experiments, weird experiments, incredible. And one of them had to do with extraocular vision in kids in a school in Mexico. So I Googled it. I Googled extraocular vision. And I realized there's something going on in Spain, strange, in the city where I live, Anicante, so strange, and it's actually happening tomorrow when I Googled it. So I went in contact and put in contact with these people. And I went and I saw with my own eyes how a group of kids were seeing without their eyes. They were blindfolded, allegedly seeing without their eyes. They were blindfolded. They could report colors, figures, and even read. So I could not believe what I saw. So what did I do? Well, I'm a theoretician by training, by the way. So I read everything I could. And I found something. There's quite a lot of material, actually, if you scratch. In particular, I want to highlight this article that's 40 years old by Jacobo Grimberg called Exocular Vision, and a book that's this year 100 years old by Jules Romain in France called Eyeless Sight. As it turns out, to make a story, long story short, well, throughout different decades in different countries, in different traditions, under different names, such as extraocular vision, eyeless sight, dermal optical perception, extra retinal vision, info vision, vibra vision, mind sight, some have the R because are methods that are called and sold. Well, this, there's this constellation of claims that people can see without their eyes. And of course, they're, they're related in a way, maybe they're cousins with remote viewing and maybe also with lucid dreaming and out of body experience. 
experiences. So here we have this, this island, this archipelago, right? And of what I call the edges of consciousness. Edges because they're a frontier in research, as we, as we can see at, at, at IONS, and also edges because they're marginalized. Okay, so back to the proposal. So I took the skeptics seriously because the, 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 the thing was not moving. Some said, well, if you're using blindfolds in those kids, well, you can always, and that was Martin Gardner, a famous skeptic who wrote a paper in Science in 1966. He said, well, you can always cheat. You can always no speak. And, and so I propose kind of a painstakingly how you would use blindfolds, design helmets, put things into boxes, wear gloves, because there's another theory that says you're perceiving through your skin, Re rule out all sensory information. That's the first chunk. The second chunk to climb up the impossibility ladder is that, well, Gardner himself said, well, perhaps we could only really believe in this because you, at some point you need to ask a, a hardcore skeptic, well, what would you be willing to consider? And he said, well, maybe if a blind person could do it, maybe we then consider it. Well, I found one. I found one and it seems he can do it. So what I proposed here is this kind of stringent set of controls, including what I call a triple blind, if you allow me, a triple blind set of experiments where we have all these controls, a blind person, and also the experimenter should not know what's going on. This is technical, but this is also important not to convey subliminal information. And so I propose a series of these, basically two types of experiments, discrimination tests, telling, let's say, blue cups versus red cups, and also the perception of complex images, which remind me from what I've been reading about what's been done forever in remote viewing. Complex images like a fireplace by the beach or a helicopter, and then people, and again, I've seen it, allegedly, they can see or they can tell you what's in there. Probably it's not seeing, probably it's not even perception, probably it's something higher up the river. Okay, why I think this can also be fruitful? Because I hope, and I think that's what's gonna happen, the, the percentage, let's say you're telling blue cup versus red cup, it's not gonna be 42%, you know, a little bit above chance with a p-value that's huge. Most of the time, if that's happening, it's 90 something percent. So that's, it's gonna be a miracle in plain sight. So I think that's useful. One needs to do statistics, but it's great if one can produce in a lab or in hands or invite to the lab a phenomenon that's way above 50%. Now, that, that would be all about the data with more details in my proposal, but we should not have a naive understanding of science. And I want to mention, mention this in ending, right? Because you can bring all the evidence in the world, but again, we know that to update our beliefs, and you can explain this through a Bayesian framework that I won't discuss now, but to update your beliefs, you need new data, but also you need to, in a way, mathematically multiply this new data with your priors. And if your prior of that thing being really true is zero, no matter how good data, how much data you bring, it's always going to be impossible, right? So that's why the theoretical approach is very important. Uh, as I said, I'm a theoretical physicist turned neuroscientist, but I didn't want to start with the whiteboard. I wanted to start with you know, be beyond whiteboards and beyond seminar rooms. And so that's why I based it on this experimental paradigm. But we need to mention models, metaphysics, all these M's, models, metaphysics, metaphors. And when it comes to metaphors, let me just talk about meta metaphors. And we can do this thanks to William James, who more than a hundred years ago on a paper entitled On Immortality, On Human Immortality, said, well, you can conceive of the function, the relationship between brains and minds in two broad categories, the two Ps, one as productive, the other one as permissive. So the brain produces the mind. This is what, to just cast a number, 99% of neuroscientists believe. Of course, what else could it be? And producing here means, well, the brain produces the mind like a, like a chimney produces smoke. But then there's the whole other class, which is the permissive understanding. So here, the brain permits the mind. So it's more like the, the brain permits the mind like, like a radio permits or filters or, or tunes into voices we hear. The voices are not inside the radio, right? Now, mentioning metaphysics, so I, I'm, basically, I'm basically basing my, my theoretical approach in William James, in Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy, which I cannot discuss, and my superhero, Henry Bergson, 
who way beyond anybody probably spoke about perception as non-local in space and memory as non-local in time. Okay, so some more things to mention theoretically. As I said, probably it's not vision because when some of these subjects report what they see, they also smell things. They also have hunches that are not strictly visual. So it must be something higher up. Other lines of inquiry had to do with the coupling of the ability of seeing with our eyes with the electromagnetic field. Because at the, at the end of the day, well, there may be some laws that are shared. And at the end of the day, the person needs to report it with the tongue, which means that the brain has set, sent a message, right? So the brain, and that's really important, we need to go beyond the brain, but we need to go back to the brain. Now, let me also quickly mention all these prefixes, paranormal, pseudoscience, supernatural, anomalous. Well, if you change the frames, then these weird, weird, wild facts, as James said, then all of a sudden are very normal, very scientific, and very anomalous. Sorry, very, very normal. Okay, in ending, I don't propose a killer experiment. That would be kind of a Twitter version kind of understanding of science works. One needs many experiments and replications. Um, I don't, I ask for permission to explore a what without a how. Because even if you show the data, well, what's the mechanism? Well, we don't know. Therefore, just come back in 10 years when you have it. Well, I think this proposal allows us to simultaneously figure out whether and how. Um, regarding the sociology, well, and the politics of knowledge, we must speak about these things. There's taboo, there's canceling, there's reputation damage. And Reason goes to the side, intuition goes to the side, and it all becomes about deep emotions and biases and power. So fortunately or not, science is what scientists make of it. So what I think this can do is to help the crumbling of what I call the unholy trinity of reductionism, mechanicism, and materialism. The two first ones are easier, but materialism is tougher. And I think we're heading towards a post-materialist. I like to call it trans-materialist because I think we need matter anyways. Um, although nobody really knows what that is, even those that card carrying materialists, if you ask them what is matter, well, they really don't know. So I think we're making advance towards going beyond this unholy trinity. And really in ending, I must confess, I'm a newcomer in this. And I'm deeply grateful to this community for just receiving me so well. I want to give thanks to Eddie Villimoria for supporting this, Jordi Inbert, from whom I've learned a lot about extraocular vision, he's a coach in Spain, and my friend Rupert Sheldrake. And this has been a, this is a celebration, but I also want to use it as a manifesto. A manifesto <laughs> to those, let's call them middle-aged scientists that to come out of the closet, please come out of the closet. We cannot be doing night science, day science where we believe some things. And then in our corridors, in our coffee rooms, in the weekends, we believe other things. We need to come out of the closet. And I think initiatives like these and IONS are portals for us to be able to do so. And I'm doing it today with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And here, here, I'm wholeheartedly in support of that intention that this effort uh, breaks the taboos and allows people to absolutely come out of the closet, have transparent dialogues about this, because I, I believe it can't happen in a siloed way. We do need to collaborate, communicate, synergize with each other. And I think it's very telling that we didn't just give one prize and that the $100,000 prize was split amongst these three very different approaches to answering the prize question. So thank you, all of you. I'd like to invite all of you up now. We're going to have all of you up on the screen so that we can give a final congratulations and round of applause. If you have your um, beautiful prize, if you could please uh, hold it up. Wolfhard could not receive it in time uh, being in Europe, but I'd like to invite Wolfhart to also be on the screen here and just huge congratulations to all of you for your incredible work, uh, your incredible proposals. And we're just deeply excited for how this is going to break open uh, this field of non-local consciousness. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you see these beautiful accolades coming in our virtual symbols here on the side. Too bad we all can't be cheering and screaming loudly, which was probably be what would be happening. So it is continuing. So just let that all in, all the hard work. Um, just feel that incredible gratitude and warmth for all of you and the work that you're doing. Absolutely. It's still going. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Ah, letting that all in. So I'm going to pass it to Andrea now. Thank you so much. It's still going. So I'm going to let Andrea choose when she wants to uh, jump off here. Everyone's very happy. So thank you so much. Oh, I love it. And I love seeing all the emojis coming by the side of the screen and all the congratulations and just really wonderful to hear all each of your proposals. And we'll be sending this out in the follow-up email, but we will be sending out their full essays and proposals for anyone who wants wants to read and follow up with their work as well as ways to follow up on their work uh, websites and things like that. So again, congratulations to the award winners. And I'm really delighted to say we have one more panel. I can't believe how quickly today has already flown by. So we get to hear from um, some of the judges and the people who are behind the scenes making this award happen. So I'm gonna give just a very quick intro um, and then Helene will be leading us in our final panel discussion. So uh, on our panel today, we have Dr. Peter Bansell, who holds a doctorate in experimental physics from the University of Pennsylvania. And he began working in SCI research shortly after the US terror attacks of September 11th, 2001, when he joined a small group looking at data from the Global Consciousness Project. His experiments probes into the inter interaction of SCI and entanglement in quantum systems. So just a little bit about Peter and a little bit about our next presenter, Dr. Bruce Damer, who is a Canadian American multidisciplinary scientist, innovative designer and speaker. Dr. Damer has spent two decades developing testable geochemical hypothesis for how life originated on earth and where it might be found in the universe. So welcome Bruce. We also have Dr. Roger Nelson, who is the director of the Global Consciousness Project, or GCP. He is the author or co-author of 75 technical papers and two books. In 1980, he joined the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, or PEAR Lab, to coordinate research, and he created the GCP in 1997, building a world-spanning random number generator network designed to gather evidence for coalescing global consciousness. And finally, we have Dr. Marilyn Schlitz, who's an acclaimed social scientist, award-winning author, and master teacher. She's conducted clinical laboratory and field-based research into consciousness, transformation, and healing. Her book includes Living Deeply, Consciousness and Healing, and Death Makes Life Possible. She's also the CEO, President Emeritus, and Senior Fellow here at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. So welcome, everyone. And Helene, let me pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And it is such an honor to be here with some of the judges that supported this process. And as Arno mentioned, uh, we had 108 uh, applications that were submitted for this. And you can imagine the very, very difficult job that the judges had to narrow that down to 10 and then to narrow it down even further. And so I imagine many of you were surprised because the original intention was just to give one prize and we uh, decided to actually give three. So we thought it very important to give you a little bit of insight into that process and to hear from the judges about consciousness research in general and the challenges that we face on it and perhaps share some ideas about uh, insights from this process for how we can best move forward. So 
Each of the panelists will have about three minutes uh, to answer the two questions. And I'm gonna just go in the order that um, I see on our screen here. So the first question is, what are the challenges in building a testable theory with our current scientific tools? And I will uh, start with Marilyn. Well, thank you for um, hosting this and for Linda for uh, committing her resources and her intentions to expanding our field. I think that, you know, from some of the comments we've heard about the foundations and uh, founding of IONS, it really has been about challenging our core metaphysical assumptions. And if we are committed to a worldview based entirely on materialism and physical reality being only that which can be measured, touched, tasted um, out there, then it doesn't leave much room for that aspect of interiority or subjectivity that I think all of us find most intimate and most fundamental to our personal identity. So I think that what we need to do is really begin to de deconstruct those assumptions to begin to think about how a post-materialist science may emerge and how ultimately as we create new tools, new epistemologies for understanding the nature of reality, that ultimately we may begin to build a new model of reality, a new ontology. And I think that's been an important part of IONS throughout its history. And I think that for all of us, it really is about hospicing uh, a dying paradigm that is no longer effective for understanding the fullness of our experience and ultimately midwifing something new. And so this is our chance, our opportunity, and our privilege. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Marilyn. And I'll pass it now to Roger. What are the challenges in building a testable theory with the current scientific tools? I would like to also start by saying thank you this to Ions and to Linda O'Brien for putting together something that's actually almost startling to me in its depth and power. And I uh, really imagine that it is a kind of um, a moment uh, that's a step forward. But I'm uh, inclined to think about the challenges as something that really should stimulate creativity uh, because these are not easy matters. It's not an easy thing to come up with uh, e either a theory or a test if you do have some sort of theory. So we the steps in creativity to really make it function have to do with steeping yourself in what is known already. Try to gather the wisdom that has been produced by other people over the years uh, that's relevant to, the, to, relevant to this matter. And then you need to let that um, simmer and uh, ferment and uh, ultimately to uh, reveal itself a, as a kind of um, insight or maybe even a, an epiphany if we are lucky. So uh, what I'm suggesting is to take the challenge as a an opportunity for creativity and do and in some sense, I almost think that we should ignore the problems, ignore the challenges, and go ahead with the clearest question we can muster, because a really good question uh, in, in, inevitably has the answers built right in. Thank you so much, Roger. I'm going to pass it now to Peter. Same question. What are the challenges with our current tools? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Helen. Can you hear me all right? Great. 
Okay, well, again, my th also my thanks to Noetics, to IONS, and also to Linda for making this possible. And this has been a really fun process to be on the jury and cause for lots of uh, head scratching and reflection. And the questions that you're posing, Elena, are, are, are interesting ones. And I want to uh, respond to it. I, I, when I was thinking about it, I thought I would respond from the point of view of my, my being an experimental physicist, but, but actually from my training as a physicist, because I reflected on this notion of particularly not the theory part, but with today's scientific tools. And one way that we can always move forward is, is to have better tools. Like, you know, you look at the history of astronomy and it's a lot of it is about making a better telescope, right? And then things, things open up. Um, clearly in research altogether, the most important tool is the researcher. And especially in a field that is having to do with consciousness, it might be the one thing in the laboratory that at least we're pretty sure is conscious, which is also the researcher. So one thing that's an interesting approach to this, not it's just one aspect, one slice of it, is to work on the tool that is the researcher. So I know when I got my doctorate in physics, how did it go? There was a couple of years of you're taking classes and then you take an exam. And then what happened as an experimentalist is you go in and, into the lab with a question, but first you have to build an instrument. And then once you've built that instrument, then you can apply it to the questions. Now, if the most important tool is the researcher, then perhaps we need to look at how we form and train the, the researchers so that they can be more intimately aware of their own experience of consciousness to, to better refine as sort of as Roger was, was suggesting the questions that are posed. So what I would suggest is that if we had people who want to become researchers in consciousness studies, one thing that we might offer them is to spend a couple of years in introspection or meditation. And then once they come out, then continue with applying that deep, deep insight that we as busy researchers, we often don't get to do that, you know, go spend a couple of years in a cave or something. But that would be an interesting twist on the whole project of consciousness research, I think. That's great. Thank you, Peter. And that's very aligned with IONS, you know, what we call the noetic handshake, right, where we have the science plus the direct experience. And with the synergy of the both, can we have a much uh, broader, coherent understanding of these phenomenon? So yeah, actually, that's a, that's a great thought. And I really appreciate that. I actually just spent a week observing uh, mediumship and physical mediumship, which just completely opened my scientist mind about tools and how do you study this, et cetera. Uh, thank you, Peter. I'm going to pass it now to Bruce for the same question about challenges. And again, uh, repeating thank you, Ions, and thank you, Linda G. O'Brien, for making this all possible. Uh, one of the things is drawing on all of your thoughts and on especially Don Hoffman's reaching into physics to look for, in a sense, a new field, a new way we might be interconnected. My field is origin of life. And you can think of it as the atom smasher of biology that takes biology all the way back to the beginning of the first what we call proto-cells. And in a conversation with Rupert Sheldrake at the 2019 IONS conference, uh, we asked the question, if morphic resonance is happening, between biological entities, uh, how can we test that in the most simple form? And why I really liked Don's presentation is let's reduce variables to simple systems and test them. You know, that's how, how physics would do it. We can do it in biology by building these self-assembled lipid polymer protocells. And what Rupert proposed is that these units uh, might influence each other's rates of evolution from the very beginning of life, from when, the, when that algorithm kicks in that perhaps energy with information and growth and adaptation begin. And our science is on the very verge of demonstrating that in the lab, how that 
basically ignition occurs. So if consciousness or conscious connection between us in the biological world, between our minds, between our minds and the entire universe is a connective medium or conductive medium, can we witness it emerging de novo at basic uh, recreations of life's beginning? So that's another frontier for people to think about. It's another future proposal for this work. But that's my perspective is the, the physics of biology and the core units of, of biology itself. Uh, and the tools there are quite different. Um, so in a way, it's a, there's a convergence of things and we see it through the prize competition, all the different approaches, the random number generators, the experiential approach of seeing without eyes, Don Hoffman's kind of smashing the atom approach. It's beautiful. And I would suggest that ions uh, from way back from Willis Harmon and actually from Wink Francis in the 1990s, he proposed that ions was placing its noetic bets on a kind of roulette wheel. And what this competition is, is that placing bets on different research approaches and let's spin the wheel together because there may be multiple ways in. And this is something that Dean Reagan pointed out. There's multiple ways into a vision of what this thing is. And so let's place a lot of bets in the coming years. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, that's so true. And, you know, when we were first talking about this prize and what it would look like, I mean, that was the conversation, there are so many theories for non-local consciousness, but how do we actually test them? And what are the testable theories that already exist? And, you know, Arno alluded to this a little bit, but there were about five different kind of categories of strategies that the 108 applications took. Um, the first one was a purely physicalist model. So explaining how consciousness could extend beyond the brain using um, what we already know about the material world. The second strategy was consciousness and quantum mechanics. So extensions of intention affecting, um, you know, various targets like lasers or um, things such as that. The third category were energetic models representing a non-physical model of consciousness. So fields or um, uh, matrix, uh, various non-physical models. The fourth category of strategies was a psi test or a psychic test that was done during an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience. So, you know, there've been experiments where people attempt to um, say, observe something at the ceiling of an operating room during cardiac arrest. So there are a variety of proposals like that. And then finally, there were uh, numerous uh, side tasks and um, expansions of things that we already have seen through uh, parapsychology research. So it was really quite incredible to see the various strategies that people were taking to attempt to um, answer the prize's question. So I'm gonna uh, move us along now to our second question because, you know, really right now for, for me and our team is, well, what's next? You know, how do we actually um, learn from this whole process that we've embarked on this year and um, make it even better? for the next year. And so my question to you now is, what do you think is the most important aspect of a successful consciousness research program going forward? And we'll just uh, go in the same order, starting with Marilyn. All right, well, thank you. And I want to really acknowledge my colleague and friend, Jonathan Schooler, and his uh, approach to replication. And in a very systematic and detailed way, to invite creativity into a laboratory setting, and then to invite colleagues to systematically replicate. And I think that 
you know, obviously replication is one of the great cornerstones of science. And I think it is one of the great barriers to making greater progress in this field is, you know, people are interested in novelty. They do a one-off. Nobody bothers to replicate it because people are on to something else. And so I would really love to see a, uh, expanded programmatic enterprise in which we pull the top one to three uh, experiments or studies that we feel are indicative of, of the question, is consciousness something beyond the brain? And then uh, ask people from different disciplines and different orientations to replicate that in their laboratory, under their own circumstances. And then let's see if we can really begin to build a coherent body of science using that kind of process. So that's kind of my best thinking on it. And thanks to Jonathan. Thank you, Marilyn. How about you, Roger? I, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, there needs to be for a successful, powerful, effective program in consciousness research needs to be a, a driver like IONS. I mean, this group has done amazing kinds of things. There are some others, but IONS has, been, has this huge um, um, audience of people who are interested, and uh, IONS has managed to keep a large number of those people interested and to foster things like this amazing prize contest. But I have five points that I think are all very important kinds of things for a consciousness research program. They work for other things too. Maybe the most important one beyond the driver is a clarity of purpose. Uh, what is our intention? Um, the, what kind of focus? Do we want to maintain and what's the guiding light for the research that we have in mind for consciousness research why do we want to do this what's the what's the, our mission should we cho choose to accept it and the second point is teamwork and collaboration and there is i think no substitute for that there is a, a occasionally in our history a lone genius who is come up with something awesome. But even that lone genius is probably talking to his friends <laughs> along the way. There is, I think, an, an immense um, synergy, a kind of um, collaborative um, coherence that comes about when you do have a people, when you have a team, who are all focused in the same direction. The third point, openness. And this is nothing new. But we have to be uh, open. We have to give all potential paths uh, attention and permission. We need to accept that uh, there's no one way to answer a particular question. Fourth, and this everybody talks about, and it isn't necessarily easy, nevertheless, rigor. <laughs> it sounds like so, so uh, materialistic scientist, right? <laughs> but we don't want to fool ourselves. We don't want to waste our time kidding ourselves because we didn't do the experiment well enough or didn't do it right. And then finally, patience. And this harkens um, to a different, slightly different version of what Marilyn was talking about, um, replication. One of my um, effective um, academic mentors while I was in graduate school is um, a scientist, I think he was an optical scientist named Georg von Bekeshi. And his principle uh, for doing really good research was to do it five different ways. Ask the same question five with five different sets of tools and methodologies. Patience, we got a long way to go. Thank you, Roger, those were beautiful. And yes, that last one is so important, especially in our culture today. You know, things move so fast and people expect results so fast. And, and you know, in science, it doesn't move that quickly. So 
if you're doing it right, it takes time. So thank you for that reminder. Peter. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting question. What's the most, I'm reading it here. What's the most important aspect of a consciousness research pro program? I find myself agreeing with Marilyn and Roger. And when I looked at this question, uh, I looked for like, what is the one word in that question that I wanna go from? And so taking from Rogers saying, we have a long way to go, I'm looking at the word program. So it's a program, meaning that we do, it's a long-term view. And I mean, ultimately the most important thing is the personal meaning that it brings, right? And the transformation that comes from changing our minds. But leaving that to the side, I'm gonna answer this from a sort of a physics pers perspective. And if I say this is a long-term project, what that basically means is we're going on a long, a long journey and we don't have a map, right? So mm -hmm. what can we bring with us? We, well, we might bring a compass with us, right? And if the compass is, is working well, then that might guide us as the decisions where, where we go left or right. So I think that one of a very important thing that we can bring is to, to work on this compass. So what do I mean by that? And, and here now I wanna just take an example from physics, which, you know, credit to them, they have many times hospiced certain ideas and birthed new ones. Uh, along the journey, painful as that might be, and also exciting. And a wonderful example is the example of, of quantum mechanics, right? So I want to just, just take one minute just to, to, to look at that. But basically what, what, what I'm saying about, about the compass, it's, it's the skill in posing the good question. So you want to be able to, co to pose the question that is a scalpel, and then also know how you can bring that question um, to, to be answered in an empirical way, right? And so the quantum mechanics is interesting because this all, the quantum mechanics sort of like was there in 1925 when Heisenberg came up with his matrix mechanics and it worked. So here was a theory that it worked, but it didn't answer any of our questions. So quantum mechanics was basically an oracle. You would ask it a question and it would tell you an answer, but you don't know where that answer came from. So you say, what is the electron going to do? It would tell you what the electron would do, but it wouldn't tell you what it's like to be an electron. So the, the Heisenberg's quantum mechanic was a little bit like um, AI, actually. It works very well, but we don't know how it works. So a little bit after quantum mechanics had its theory, then there was the, the famous EPR, the einstein podolsky rosen paper, which was, was basically a paper says that well, there's some paradoxes here and we need a program. We need a re research program that's gonna tell us what this means. And so that was like, the, the, there was this crystallization of the, uh, of the notion that we do need a program, but it took a long time just to get to the program. The program didn't actually get going really until John Bell came along with his Bell's theorem, right? And what was John Bell's theorem? This was a theorem that, that was a riff sort of on the, the EPR paradox and also Schrodinger's cat kind of things. And what John Bell discovered is that there was a way of posing a question that you can ask the oracle that is going to give you an answer to something that's happening inside the oracle. So this was a clever thing that he did. And it, it has a, it, sometimes it's called experimental metaphysics. Sometimes it's called creating a no-go theorem. That's the jargon that they actually use in quantum foundations these days. It's a no-go theorem. So what did John Bell do? He basically realized that there's a way that you can interact with the oracle so that the oracle will tell you about what it's like to be the oracle. But the oracle can't speak to that. So you have to play a game of 20 questions. And you have to have a way of 20 questions. Your questions have to be able to be implemented empirically, maybe as an experiment. And that's an adventure now that is, that is going great guns. And they're, they're actually starting to, to understand differently 
something about quantum mechanics and maybe we can do that too. So I just, I'm gonna just take 30 seconds if I could, just to give one more example of how powerful that kind of thinking is. Think of Einstein's special relativity. So what is Einstein's special relativity? It's basically saying common notions plus one little experimental datum, which is that speed of light is constant. If I do physics here on the moon, it's gonna look the same. And everything happens in space and time. And you put those three together and what happens is you get a contradiction and it says something's wrong. So it's so such a simple framing of showing that you've got something wrong. And then the question is, is which of these three, speed of light, moon or earth, or space and time, do I have to throw out? And then Einstein's brilliance, you see, this, he, he, by framing it that way, he can see what to do. And his brilliance was that you didn't have to throw out any of them. The only thing you had to do was take space and time and just tweak it, which really was the, the innovation. So space and time became space time. So, so I think this kind of clarity of, of, of working on how we can form the questions and then translate them to something that can be experimentally or empirically uh, looked at is where we really need to make an effort and just like the the like the, the an example of this is is you know everything for us happens in time right we get older and everything like that everything we know happens in time except one thing and that's consciousness that's always now that's the one thing that's not in time right? so how do you take that and make that into a no go theorem that we can tell and ask the oracle, so we know should we go right or left in our in our journey. So that's the kind of way I think we should go into. Thank you, Peter. That's the exact question, right? We're struggling with. Thank you so much. All right, Bruce, passing it to you. Just acknowledging, Peter, you may have come up with a noetic perennial philosophy just now. Beautifully, beautifully stated. Um, I'm going to go. I wrote a piece, a little piece I'd like to read for you, which is actually indicative of the reason that uh, I'm part of IONS, at least as a science advisor, and why I just love the quest and the question. And it addresses, uh, it goes back to IONS roots in 1971, when Edgar Mitchell was returning from the moon. And you heard Claudia refer to this right at the beginning of, of her opening uh, history of IONS. And the actual thing that happened, if you really dig deep into his reporting from, from his book and, and the new edition as well, is that he what they were doing was rotating the command and service module in order to equalize the temperature, because that was done pretty commonly on the Apollo missions to make sure one side didn't get too hot. So as Edgar was sitting by the window, he was sort of off duty, he noticed star fields passing the window. And, and in that context, his, he went into what we've you know, now called the samadhi in space, where he realized with his scientific training that the uh, atoms in his body were forged in those very stars that he, see, he saw that band of the sort of local universe passing, and that he was a creature or a, a creation of the forging process of those stellar furnaces. And then at that moment was the epiphany where he was just filled with numinous joy. And there's actually, you, you, you can see this on footage where he's got this shit eating grin. Uh, there's actual footage of him having this moment. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, and so what he described later was this numinous joy came into him and he was taken out of the reality of thinking that he was an isolated human in this great threatening cosmos. You know, they were just a thin wall away from total destruction, like the, the poor people in the Titan submersible, just a thin wall away. And, and instead, he saw himself as, a, as, as linked to that cosmos, purposefully linked to a cosmos that created him and that supported and nurtured him. It was a really big transformation. 
And so he came in as a scientist and a test pilot and all those sorts of things, a Navy guy, into a really different experience that he didn't have an explanation for until he started investigating when he got back to Houston, meeting with people, what, you know, what happened to me? And what he felt was that he was interconnected with this huge web. And I want to suggest that this huge web of interconnection gives us many gifts. It brings gifts to us. It, it gives us our downloads of genius and flashes of insight in the arts, science, tech. It, it's, that's what comes from this web. It allows us to view happenings in the world and synchronize with them, not just with our minds, but our hearts and our bodies. So when something is happening to some people in one part of the world, we feel it. Uh, that it also even potentially allows us to project a bit into the future and pull events from the future. And this is sort of pre not precognition ideas. It allows us to shape reality out in front of us, which is really important for our survival. And I put forth that all of life shapes its future reality. Uh, and, and then, in a sense, all of this is our guide. So the net that we're plugged into, now we've made a, a physical nervous system called the internet, which it patterns onto, is our guide to how we are, to how we feel, to how we move forward. This net, this interconnected uh, web, all this Huxley called it mind at large. Uh, Carl Jung postulated that it was a synchronous field. Um, synchronous events would happen through that web. And I would suggest to you that we, in our time, we can declare that it's like an operating system, but it's code that's running all around us. It's like we're the fish in the water of this operating system of this web. We're breathing it. It propels us. It pushes us around. It, it provides us nutrition and support and buoyancy, just as Edgar Mitchell felt the universe was providing that. And to understand the OS of that web, to create protocols to ping it and say, let's make a request of it. To understand its language would be the greatest tool that homo, that, that human beings were ever gifted in our hands for our future. And positive intention and affirmation perhaps shape and shake that web in more positive, clear, coherent ways any panic, worry, and doubt might shake it in another way and make it more noisy. You know, all of these things have been, they're deep in human history. So why this is important, let's paraphrase Ion's first president, Willis Harmon, who wrote this beautiful piece, and not before, uh, long before he passed. Perhaps the whole is not only trustworthy, the web, but if we also hold it preciously and support its health, we will all change our minds and we will all win together. And I think that that, that for me is the value to society and to each of us of this work. Thank you so much, Bruce. And thank you to each one of our panelists today for sharing your thoughts about the cha challenges and future steps. I'd like to also acknowledge the judges who were not here today. All of you gave your time and your commitment to embark on this incredible journey of this prize this year. And I invite you and the audience to stay tuned for what the prize will be next year, because it doesn't have to be the same. So we're really excited about um, creating, building off of this to create what the next year's prize is going to be. So just offer everybody deep gratitude, and I'm going to pass it uh, back to Claudia for our closing. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Helene. Thank you, panel. Um, boy, what a day. I have to admit that I feel a little like I've been on the spin cycle of my washing machine. <laughs> I opened this historic gathering for IONS with our founder, Ed Mitchell, and I'd like to close with him. One more story. In 1976, Ed wrote to then CIA Director George Bush Sr. as a follow-up to a private meeting they had about remote viewing and the profound implications of if it worked. 
And he wrote in that letter, George, one runs the risk of being very wrong when sticking his neck out as I am doing. However, I feel very deeply about these observed events whose implications I think are far reaching. I may be wrong, but what if I'm right? I want to thank our winners and everyone who spoke today for sticking your necks out, or as Alex called for, for coming out of the closet. I feel all of us on this call can imagine the profound implications of our world, um, of these different hypotheses that we heard about today being proven right. And Todd Bureau in our chat today wrote, the paradigm falls with the accumulation of these proofs. Looking forward to the cascade fall, hope to be physically alive for the furious clapping sessions. <laughs> And I wanted to say me too, Todd, I want to live in the world that this science suggests is emerging. And also, um, I agree with Peter Mary, who wrote in the chat, with all this great work, we must be getting close to the tipping point. Bruce mentioned Carl Jung, and Jung said that the upheaval of our world and the upheaval of our consciousness are one and the same thing. The many simultaneous crises being experienced in the world today can be considered evolutionary drivers pushing us to finally discover who we really are and what we are truly capable of. This year is the 100th anniversary of the term noosphere to describe the collective thinking, feeling layer of life surrounding earth. So it is a perfect time for humanity to move into this conscious recognition of a connected consciousness of a fundamental consciousness in the world. So thank you again to our winners, to our presenters. Thank you to all of our applicants. Thank you to the ION staff and to everyone for joining us either on Zoom or streaming, whether live or by recording for supporting IONS. As a nonprofit, we rely on the generosity of a global community of noetic explorers to be able to conduct our leading edge research and outreach. And finally, thank you, Linda O'Brien, with apologies to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today reinforced my belief that though the arc of scientific discovery is long, it bends toward noetics. Thank you everyone for joining us.